about Sam, I will try to answer for them. Here I am. So, so we got like third anytime, <laughs> anywhere. Remember, they come from the contract. And then we saw the sandals after the They don't pass because they were not the same number. And I'm Sorry, the decision was not to go public with that. How many people are there on the panel? I made 20 of these. I thought that was plenty, but maybe not. At the it, end of his career, he's not doing that. Okay. I should probably send this to you for further oh, distribution, too. Take your seat, so well, that's. Uh... Yeah, I said, I keep seeing people say, I don't know who they are. <laughs> you know, <for> decades. <laughs> You had. Oh, no, this is better than that. Do a quick sound check and uh, make sure that those folks joining us remotely can hear. Okay, good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth meeting of the National Academies Committee to review the long-term operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. My name is Peter Goodwin, the chair of the committee, and we're joined today by Dr. Laura Ayles and Stacey Karras, who are senior staff officers of the National Academies for the two divisions that are supporting this effort. We're also joined by Dr. Mooney, the instigator of the initial study of the US Bureau of Reclamation. We will start with a land acknowledgement. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, the Kachal Dehi band of the Wintun in Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, the Kachal Dehi Wintun nation, and the Yoka Dehi Wintun nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. <coughs> One piece of housekeeping for those of you who are here. Uh, in the meeting room with us. There are four emergency exits in this room. The two exits on the side lead outside the patio, and there's the two doors on the inside that you entered the room. This is a very large committee of 18 people. Everyone is attending this meeting with the exception of Dr. Fernando, who sends his apologies due to a long-standing commitment that preceded this committee. He has provided input prior to the meeting and will, of course, catch up through the recordings. We are also joined by Sabina Vaidness and Maya, Maya Frey, the staff scientist for the National Academies. The committee would like to acknowledge the willingness of all the participants to date in these meetings to contribute to the publication's opinion and advice. We recognize that an undertaking of this scale is only as good as the input we receive. Therefore, we would like to thank the agencies and organizations who have committed their staff to co contribute to this major undertaking. So this is our fourth meeting. The first three meetings have concentrated on the three actions in our scope of task. And in addition to that, many of you have joined the webinar from Dr. Rose on the models and the scientific underpinning 
used to address the questions raised in the biological assessment and the draft environmental statement. In this meeting, we are focusing on the other stresses beyond just water abstraction or diversion. We have heard in earlier meetings that the system is immensely complex. The system is highly dynamic and there is no simple single magic bullet or action. This morning, we are going to hear from eminent experts who have devoted much of their careers to understanding the ecological and environmental stresses within the system. After lunch, we are going to drill down on the consequences and the future challenges of climate change. Climate has been intertwined throughout the first three meetings, but today we will hear from both climate researchers and the leaders within agencies responsible for mitigation and adaptation. We will follow this with a session devoted to some of the many NGOs who specialize in the health and recovery of the environment, as well as the social implications of ecosystem change. And today we'll conclude with an open mic session. If you wish to address the committee in this session, please sign up on the sheet at the back of the room, or if you are joining remotely, please drop a note to Maya at the email in the chat. Please include your affiliation and sign up by three o'clock today so we can allocate equal time to speakers. Thank you. We've also condensed the public part of this fourth meeting into one day to be respectful of the time of all the participants of your institutions and agencies. Before I introduce the first session, I would just turn to Laura. Did I miss anything in that introduction? I'd like to say from the academy. <laughs> So we go. So on to our first session, the ecological and environmental stresses. We have asked each panelist to make a brief introductory statement to address some or all of five questions posed by the committee. After this, each of those presentations will be about 15 minutes. And I apologize in advance for cutting people off because we really want to get to the QA to delve down on some of the deep experience of the panelists. So after those presentations, we will take a five minute break and then come back for Q&A from the committee. And if we have time, we will open it to questions from the, the public either in person or online. What I'm going to do is to introduce each of the panelists in alphabetical order. And I'm going to take a little time doing this because I think it's important for everyone participating today to understand the full depth of expertise. And then after that, we will go through the panelists in the order that appears in the public uh, agenda. First of all, in one of the versions of the agenda, uh, we missed out Dr. Wim Kimmerer, and we apologize for that. Uh, Dr. Wim Kimmerer is a research professor of biology at Emeritus at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center of San Francisco State University. He holds a bachelor's degree from Purdue University and received his PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Hawaii. In 1994, he established the Zilplankton Laboratory at the EOS Center, focused mainly on the San Francisco estuary studying both the basic ecology of zooplankton and fisheries in the estuary and management concerns such as the maintenance of declining and listed species. His current work focuses on the effects of variation of freshwater flow on fishes, particularly long fin smelt. He is a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. He co-chaired the Independent Science Board of the CalFed Bay Delta Ecosystem Restoration Program and in 2012, he received the Brown Nichols Science Award, uh, which many of you know is the most prestigious award given to researchers in the San Francisco Bay Delta area. Steve Lindley is the director of the National Marine Fisheries Service Southwest Fisheries Science Center, Fisheries Ecology Division, and the Santa Cruz Laboratory. He leads the center's research programs on California demersal and anadromous species. He is also a researcher at UC Santa Cruz Institute of Marine Sciences. 
His research interests include the ecology of anadromous fish, statistical and numerical modeling of ecological processes, time series analysis, and animal telemetry. And many of you will know he's built a real powerhouse uh, of models on fish population. He's published over 85 articles in peer-reviewed literature, serves on numerous advisory bodies, including the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Delta Science Program Science Roundtable, the North Pacific Marine Science Organization Fisheries Science Community. And Steve received his PhD from Duke University. Sam Nuoma is a research ecologist with the Institute of the Environment, University of California, Davis. He received his PhD in zoology from the University of Hawaii and has been actively involved in coordinating science and policy in the Bay Delta since the 1980s. In addition to publications, he was the first lead scientist for what is now the Delta Science Program, and more recently is co-chair of the multi-stakeholder collaborative adaptive management team, CANT. He's the founder and editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science, a rigorous peer-reviewed journal founded in 20, uh, 2003. And for, you, for those of you not familiar with the system, the reason he founded this journal, which is extremely professional, was because he recognized that scientists in agencies and NGOs didn't always have access to the peer review of literature as we do in academia. And that uh, journal, I can tell you, is reviewed and papers are downloaded from similar systems across the world. In recognition, Oh, he's published extensively on fate, bioavailability, and effects of chemical contaminants in rivers, estuaries, and lakes. And he serves on multiple advisory committees outside the Bay Delta and has served on four national sciences committees. Dr. Anka Mulasoga is currently the director of the USGS Survey's California Water Science Center. She leads and oversees a team of more than 300 scientists technicians and support personnel who conduct cutting edge water science research and monitoring in California and across the nation. Prior to joining the USGS, Anka worked with the California Delta Stewardship Council as the first lead scientist for the Interagency Ecological Program for the San Francisco Estuary and just did a tremendous job coordinating those multi-agency efforts. She's held scientific positions with the California Department of Water Resources and at UCS Davis. She received her PhD in ecology from UC Davis. Dr. John Rosenfeld is the San Francisco Bay Keeper, science director. He studied and advocated for the protection of San Francisco <clears throat> Bay's native fish and fisheries for more than 30 years. He's published numerous peer-reviewed research on the Bay's watershed salmon and smelt and impacts of Central Valley water management on various, various imperiled species. He's authored Federal and State Endangered Species Act listing petitions for longfin smelt, which was recently federally listed, and California white sturgeon, which was recently designated as a candidate for state listing. He earned his doctorate from the University of New Mexico, where he researched the evolutionary ecology of Picos pupfish and the biogeographic precursors of extinction of North American freshwater fisheries. Dr. Jan Thompson is now USGS Emeritus and recently retired from the USGS where her research concentrated on estuarine ecology with an emphasis on how benthos affects water quality and ecosystem function. Dr. Thompson received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Stanford, and her major research includes analyses of long-term data to examine how the aquatic ecology and the function of the ecosystem in San Francisco Bay and freshwater delta has changed over the past 30 years. Her research emphasizes systems thinking and the coupling between benthic and pelagic communities. Other research includes the biogeochemical processes related to benthic organism accumulation and the physical dynamics of organic and inorganic particle transfer to the bed. She's also 
been responsible for leading teams looking at aquatic ecosystems response to non-indigenous species. So with that introduction, uh, we'll now go through each of the panelists and we're going to start with Dr. Rosenfield. Um, and after that, he'll be followed by Dr. Lillian. Thank you, welcome to sit there. Oh, come oh, up to the okay. panel, which should be okay. uh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to project my talk right into your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn this ball back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to present to this committee today and be on a panel with uh, my scientific heroes. Um, I've been asked to talk about river flow and its effect on the native fishes and water quality ecosystem of San Francisco Bay's estuary. Um, I just want to note for the committee that there's a link um, rather than filling up the slides with lots of references. I just put the literature in this uh, link and you can feel free to download it uh, after the you are in. So river flow into and through the Delta uh, and out of the Delta is the single most important variable affecting native fish populations. Caveat. It's not a panacea. I'm not saying that we can only do flows, uh, but major improvements in uh, river flows are necessary, even if they're not sufficient alone. Flow affects most of the other important physical and water quality variables. So it's not an either or with other actions, it's a both and. The volume and timing of flow have been altered dramatically due to diversion and storage. But necessary changes in flow volume and timing are possible. Uh, and finally, uh, I, I want to argue that flow management is ecosystem management. So Laura told me that uh, y'all wanted more of an exposure to the fish. Um, I like that. Um, it's natural to start with Chinook salmon. I know you've heard uh, a bunch about Chinook salmon. And Dr. Lindley, of course, will tell you even more about Chinook salmon, so I'll just uh, go through them briefly. Uh, the main stressors are for this uh, for these fish, the four runs of Chinook salmon are river flow, by which I mean flow mediated variables. Um, that includes incubation temperatures, but I'll call that out as a as a special force. Uh, and for the imperiled species, the main stressor is that their populations are few and they're very isolated, which makes them susceptible to stochastic disasters some of which are happening right now. Um, river flow affects juvenile Chinook salmon survival. There's a wealth of literature, an explosion of literature on this topic in the past 10 years, most of which comes out of Dr. Lindley's lab uh, through his colleagues. And I know he'll talk more about this, but I couldn't resist. So just as an overview, one study by Cyril Michel in 2019, um, what you're looking at is the rows are three runs Central Valley Chinook salmon. Uh, the columns are from the left to the right, the log of outflow, and then in the middle, uh, well, middle and right are two different uh, variables that describe ocean conditions. Uh, and the, the x axis on the left then is river flow during out migration of each of these runs. Uh, and the y axis for all of these is the small to adult return ratio. And you can see in those panels, on the, on the left column, that there's a tremendous effect of flow during migration on returns, right? The ratio of uh, returns to, to small that out migrated. So that's fairly impressive because you're seeing this response two and three years later, right? There's two and three years in the ocean intervening between the out migration and the returns. And yet there, we still see a very strong uh, effect of flow. 
Um, Longfin smelt are a distinct population in this estuary. They have other populations up and down the coast. They're semi anadromous They spawn in fresh to slightly salty water, rear in uh, low salinity, what we call the low salinity zone, and then uh, pretty quickly migrate to marine waters, essentially, during uh, particularly during the summer months, uh, marine waters of San Francisco Bay proper and uh, the Pacific Ocean. The main stressors for this fish are winter spring delta outflow. And I would argue that entrainment related mortality is probably important, at least episodically, but women and I can arm wrestle about that later. <laughs> might disagree. Um, the graph on the right shows the uh, fall midwater trawl index of abundance for lungfin smelt. Uh, you can see it's a three to four order of magnitude decline over time because the, the y axis is uh, transformed. And based on this trend, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, did a bunch of uh, meta-analysis that indicated that this fish has a pretty high likelihood of extinction over the next two to three decades if uh, management doesn't change soon. So um, this decline pattern, uh, my colleague Levi Lewis here at UC Davis and I have been trying to, you know, kind of disaggregate the forces behind this decline pattern. Um, and so what I'm showing in those middle panels is the results of a general additive model. So the, the um, on each y-axis, it's residual uh, change in abundance. Um, and each of these variables that I'm showing is the, the regression there is uh, independent of the other variables. So the model is composed of log of delta outflow during the winter spring, log of stock, meaning previous abundance, and a year, uh, a, a time trend, a year as a variable. This model collectively exp explains 83% of the variance in the graph above. So pretty powerful. Um, the work that uh, I and some colleagues have done on age structured data about longfin smelt, separating adults from juveniles, um, because that's what we catch in our sampling program, gives some insight into what's happening here. It turns out that that flow. Um, relationship on the left is all about the transition from adults to juveniles, okay? So somewhere between spawning adult in the, in the Delta or Sassoon Bay and juveniles that when they are first detected uh, or in the months that they are detected, that's the flow effect. No other variable appears to be important. This relationship hasn't changed in about 60 years. There's no climate effect. There's no pelagic organism decline, no regime change, flow changes, spawners to recruits. Um, on the other hand, the, this time trend, which is obviously a black box, right? It is not flow, right? Statistically, it's not flow, and, and there's no evidence of, of that longer term decline trend in flow. Part of it is that the fall midwater trawl's efficiency is, has been shown to decline through time. It's just catching less fish less effectively for reasons we can discuss. But part of that decline is a uh, documented decline in survival from juvenile to adults. So why is this important? Well, juvenile survival from juvenile to adult happens mainly downstream, San Francisco Bay and the near shore ocean, right? That's where the forces driving that long, slow decline in survival are probably occurring as we <laughs> look for them. And flow has no effect there. But if we want to protect this population and we want to maintain it until we figure out what's causing the decline in survival, uh, we need to produce more juveniles. And that can be very effectively done through flow management, which um, affects the population when it is upstream, recruiting to, to uh, the sample study nets in uh, the Delta and Sassoon, Sassoon Bay and a little bit downstream of that. Okay, Delta smelt. You, I've heard a lot about and will hear a lot about delta smelt. It's our very weird, wonderful, endemic estuary uh, resident. Um, been protected under the Indian Species Act for several decades. We're learning a lot more about the stressors on this population as it disappears. Uh, there's a summer delta outflow effect on survival of this fish during the summer. Um, that's only been in effect for the past 20 years or so. It did not does not show up earlier in the in time series. Entrainment-related mortality is important. Temperature is important. And foraging habitat is important. 
which is different than saying the amount of food is important. It's not, doesn't appear to be so much about the amount of food as the environment in which these fish hunt. They hunt in pelagic waters adjacent to, or they hunt effectively in pelagic waters adjacent to tidal marshes, um, regardless of the amount of food that's available. White sturgeon, as Peter mentioned, uh, Baykeeper and our colleagues just petitioned this fish in the Bay Delta to be listed uh, as, a uh, as threatened under state and federal and species act. It's the opposite end of the spectrum <clears throat> from the Delta felt, the Delta smelt. This is the largest uh, freshwater fish in North America. Uh, the main stressors are reduced Delta flows, over harvesting the recreational fishery, and harmful algal blooms. The graph that, because we're talking about flows, the graph that I'm showing you is about flows. Uh, that's Sacramento River flow April through July into, into the Delta um, uh, over, over the year, uh, over about 40 years of sampling. The y axis is age zero juvenile white sturgeon that are caught in, by the base study in each year. Um, and you can see that below a certain level of flow, there is no recruitment of white sturgeon. And above a certain level of flow, you recruit white sturgeon every year. So white sturgeon are here to remind us that you need to focus not just on the very dry years and trying to make those a little bit less miserable. We need to focus on big river flow years too. And those are also um, becoming less frequent. Okay, so here's the part again where I reemphasize that I know that fish are not produced by the movement of water molecules. River, river flow drives a bunch of other uh, effects on habitat. Uh, some of which are listed here. We could spend all day listing listing others, uh, but I wanted to dive into one or two where there's uh, recent research that I think the committee will find interesting. Um, river flow has an effect on water temperature. You know about the upstream effect. The more water you store behind these big dams, the more temperature stratification you get, the larger your cold water pool is, and that allows you to release cold water uh, onto the incubation habitat of say Chinook salmon. All right. So those effects, that's that's just you know lake physics, pretty easy to understand, well worked out. Uh, Dr. Daniels and Danner, also from Steve Lumley's lab, uh, have explained the relationship between release temperature at the reservoir and release volume on temperature just downstream of the reservoir uh, where the where the fish are spawning. But there's a whole bunch of recent research on uh, the effect of flow, not release temperature from the reservoir, but just discharge, river discharge into the delta on temperatures uh, in the delta. So what I'm, this Andy Warhol-like thing that I'm showing you here is uh, outlines of the delta and its channels every month of the year. And this study by Bashevkin and Maharja shows that if you change flow, increase flow by a standard deviation, what happens to temperature? The blue means it's colder, the red means it's hotter. And you can see that from March through June, uh, increasing flow by a standard de deviation decreases temperatures by up to 1.2 degrees Celsius, which doesn't sound like a lot unless you're at your thermal limit, which these fish are, right? It can be a potentially powerful effect. And there are a bunch of other studies that show a similar relationship between flow and temperature downstream. But river flow affects habitat utilization. So on a floodplain, this is obvious. No inundation of a floodplain, no habitat, no, no benefit to fish. But even in tidally inundated marshes, flow is having an effect on habitat utilization. This is a study by Stuart Munch and other uh, NOAA colleagues um, showing the effect of a bunch of things on habitat utilization in, uh, or tidal marsh utilization in restored tidal marshes in the Delta. Um, there's an effect of spawners on habitat utilization because spawner, more spawners equals more fish. But uh, looking at the panels on the right, that Sacramento River flow, the upper right panel, the blue line is habitat occupancy, presence, absence. How quickly does that change? And obviously, river flow, which is the x axis, having a huge effect on occupancy. But even beyond just occupancy, the purple line in the lower right panel. Uh, is the effect of flow on catch per unit effort in occupied habitats. So that's a pretty continuous increase in the density of fish in occupied habitats as flow increases. So, you know, the upshot here is we can restore a lot of habitat, but if we're not providing conditions that 
allow for the use of that habitat, it's not habitat. Okay. Um, uh, river flow affects prey availability. That may be prey abundance, but it's also really moving prey and zooplankton into habitats where fish are, or where fish might be limited to due to other constraints. I'm not going to explain this in great detail. I think these slides sort of speak for themselves if you look at them uh, later on. Flow is affecting the abundance of zooplankton in delta smelt habitat and in Chinook salmon habitat. Uh, again, we're to use selective studies to uh, elucidate that effect. Oh, going backwards now. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the problem, of course, is that low volume and timing are radically altered due to diversion and storage. This graphic on the right is uh, a paper that I shared in advance. I hope some of you have had a chance to look at this paper by Reese et al. in 2019. The upper panel is unimpaired flow into the delta from 1930 to 2018. Unimpaired flow is the flow that would reach a certain point. There were no dams and diversions upstream. I'm not suggesting there should be no dams and diversions upstream. Consider it just an indicator of wetness in the environment every year uh, in the February through June period. The lower panel shows the actual flow into the delta in those same years. The bars are color coded by quintiles. We can. Uh, Talk about that later, but the, the squiggly line uh, on the bottom panel is showing the percentage of the unimpaired flow above that made it to the delta as actual delta out or through the delta as delta outflow in each year. And you see the time trend there. That time trend is significant across the entire period and in the recent two or three decades from 1995 until recently, there is still a decline uh, in the proportion of water reaching San Francisco Bay. Nope. So, allow or block? A few more minutes, John, perhaps. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, dams also, dams and uh, diversions also change the timing of flow. Um, what we're looking at here is two rivers, the Feather and the San Joaquin, uh, both in 2016. The blue lines are daily unimpaired flow. What would flow out of that river if there were no dams or diversions upstream? And the red lines are the actual flow hydrograph. And you can see, for instance, on the Feather River, not only are the peak flows just demolished, but the whole hydrograph is inverted in this time. Necessary, the necessary changes to flow are possible, but we have to consider the what we call the third leg of the stool, which is diversions. If diversions are sacrosanct, you've got a problem. If diversions can be modified uh, in their volume and timing, then we can make progress. The long-term operations draft environmental impact statement that we saw considers an alternative three, the modified natural hydrograph, which my colleagues and I put together uh, working with modelers at the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, it simply prioritize, makes some simple prioritizations of flow, which are uh, uh, reservoir releases, which are listed uh, there. Human health and safety comes first. Shasta cold water pool is prioritized next. Delta inflow and outflow at higher levels than we currently see is the next priority. And finally, water deliveries above, above and beyond health and human safety uh, are the final priority. Um, when we did that, uh, just a teaser and modeled that in the Delta life cycle model, uh, the purple bar there is alternative three. That's showing a geometric mean population growth above one. None of the other alternatives achieve that. So we, we can achieve uh, benefits here. Uh, and finally, um, I just want to assert that flow management is ecosystem management. I've shown you a lot of relationships with flow and abundance, flow and survival, flow and habitat use. We can also talk about these other fish. Um, that are, some of them are listed, some of them are not listed. The killer whales rely on salmon production, so have a connection to flow effects. Harmful algal blooms that plague Stockton uh, and other Delta cities every summer. Uh, harmful algal blooms are also sensitive to, uh, are repressed by increased flows. Um, so by managing flows, we're really managing a whole suite of effects and a whole suite of species. Thank you.
Steve, you're up next. I don't know if you want to sit or I'll just sit. Uh, I don't have any slides. I do have a handout. I'll pass out for everybody. On the front is a, a table. So I struggled a bit with trying to figure out how to summarize for you the many and nuanced effects that water projects have on salmon, which is a focus. And to my own surprise, I came up with a table as the format for that, which is not usually my favorite thing. But I tried to break it down because there, there's multiple dimensions here, and the, the table really has three. One is the the um, the life stages of the salmon, and then the habitats that they use, and then the impacts of the project operations, and then the impacts of the project infrastructure, the, the hard parts of it that um, don't change over time. And then the cells are sort of the, the major impacts that I think are going on there. I could have added more things to this if I wanted to be completely um, comprehensive, but I really just wanted to hit the high points. And the things in bold are the things I think are the most important, which was trying to answer the charge that I got from Laura here. And on the back, I was aiming for maybe a dozen references, and I, I ran this by uh, Cyril and Eric Danner, and they added a few others. So there's 17 on the back. Most of them are things out of our lab, but not entirely. There's a few classics in there that you'll probably be familiar with. So we don't need to look at this so much right now. I'll kind of go over uh, my responses to the, the questions, which cover a lot of this. But first, I just wanted to maybe recapitulate the presentation I gave to you last year when I talked about winter run Chinook salmon or Chinook salmon more generally, just to remind you that uh, salmon have these very compli complex life histories. They develop uh, from an egg to um, through several stages in freshwater and they migrate from headwaters to main stem rivers through the estuaries into the coastal ocean and even into the high seas. And then they make a return migration. And they have very particular requirements for um, water quality, especially temperature um, and the substrate as well. They need food, they need refuge, et cetera. And uh, within those requirements, they are capable of quite a lot of diversity. The way they, they move through the landscape uh, can be quite diverse, which is important to them. And that really arises because of the shifting mosaic of habitats that they use so if you imagine uh, on one day of the year, you could plot where you could find um, conditions that would support fry salmon, uh, the young juveniles that are living in freshwater. And you could make a map every day of that, and it would be a little bit different. And you could do it for the different life stages. And you put that all together. And if you color coded, it would be some sort of a mosaic. And that would have a strong seasonal cycle to it. And in the summer, not a whole lot of places that salmon are going to be very happy, except at the highest elevations and a few other special places. And then if you were to make those mosaics over the years, they fluctuate a lot from year to year as climate cycles impact hydrology and temperature in particular. Um, so the interaction of the salmon's ability to express diverse life histories and the shifting habitat mosaic creates a plethora potentially of life history trajectories so that the way an individual salmon can move across the landscape. And uh, salmon biologists like to categorize those and count them up and they may call them uh, life history ecotypes, um, and that's that's fine. Um, that kind of diversity is really important for salmon to be productive and withstand environmental perturbations. And you can then, as I think John gave a pretty good overview, um, water projects really are all about controlling that kind of variability, right? We, we don't want uh, a lot of flood inundation of downtown Sacramento. We don't want uh, very severe drought effects on people who need water, et cetera. So it's all about storing water and releasing it in a way to suppress this kind of variability. Uh, so that's one thing that's going on. And John really talked about the, those flow impacts as being central to this. A side product of these reservoirs is it's also moving, storing, and transporting heat as well, which turns out to be very important for salmon. They're cold water fish. They don't like it when it gets warm or hot and their different life stages are differently sensitive to that, but they all like it cold. So it's sort of inevitable that um, life history variability in salmon is going to get constrained by a water project that's moving and storing heat and water. And that's sort of the big picture of this. So uh, I made a list from uh, the most important, maybe to the lesser, but still important impacts that I think about the different stressors that are affecting salmon. And um, something that John didn't really talk about because it's a higher level thing is really the loss of access to habitats, especially at high elevation where cold water is more abundant and found in the summertime, which many, but not all salmon will need. Um, 
but also floodplains as well. Those are um, not always accessible, partly due to flow regulation and things like levees and um, channelization, et cetera. And that is a really an overarching thing that really constrains what salmon can do. And it doesn't matter how the project is operated, at least for the passage impediments for their, their spawning, which is an important reason why we have them on the Endangered Species Act list. Then after that, the altered flow and temperature regimes, uh, John did a great job of, of covering all of this. I'll just hit on a few high points there. Salmon evolved to take advantage of the hydrographs that they experienced over evolutionary timescales. And those are really, really altered. John showed that. And there are consequences for salmon, typically negative, but not always. There are uh, cases where this can be helpful to them. Uh, for winter run Chinook salmon and, and maybe fall run Chinook salmon, this egg to fry mortality is a super important thing. The dams do create conditions in wetter and cooler years, not during long droughts, that recreate the required conditions that they found in um, spring fed systems in the headwaters where they used to spawn. And they can do okay below the dam in the tailwater until these multi year droughts occur, temperatures rise above a fairly low critical threshold, and you start suffering heavy egg mortality. And we see this, I think, clearly in the data, the experimental studies that are referenced in the back support this, as well as some careful theoretical work to explain the role of oxygen really in modulating all of this. Um, another thing that, that we've found uh, with the advent of acoustic telemetry studies is that flows are really important for the survival of the migrating smolts. Um, there's a very strong correlation there, like almost a tenfold factor of survival variation from highest to lowest flows. And there were real questions about whether that could be taken advantage of through flow manipulations, because it's a correlation. And there are other things that are important in winter storms, like turbidity increases and correlations with temperature, which might be part of the explanation. But we have been in the just concluding a study of a pulse flow experiment this year and the early results I've seen from that are quite promising. We see about a fourfold increase in survival when smolts are released on a pulse, managed pulse flow compared to the base flows in between that. So that's kind of uh, very exciting news. I think that there may be a tool in the box here that we didn't fully appreciate before. Um, and then something else that's emerging from some work we've started is the importance of flow and temperature for the adult salmon that are migrating back up the river. We've been tagging fish uh, outside of the Golden Gate and watching them migrate back up. We only have a few years of this, but when we were doing this in the drought, very few fish really made it out of the bay up into the river at all. And during the colder, wetter years, the fish migrated readily uh, up into the Sacramento River at much, much higher rates. So that's that's kind of an exciting new finding there. Um, Moving down the list. So predation is another really important factor, a stressor for salmon in the bay, in the delta, and in the river, especially in the delta. Um, the, we all think heard about the native, the non-native predators, striped bass, largemouth bass, other centarchids uh, that seem to be the main cause of the high mortality that's observed in the telemetry studies. And there's a strong effect of flow on those relationships that we see. Uh, I think, yeah, I've covered that enough. And then some of the emerging issues are thymine deficiency. I think I covered that last time. This is something that's going on in the ocean as the salmon eat a lot of anchovies. They become deficient in thymine, which uh, expresses itself as early life stage mortality. Um, another issue is the food supply, we've heard, I think, a fair bit of that, or you have heard about the radical changes in the delta conversion from tidal marshes, which were highly productive for food items for many fishes, being converted to agriculture and a great reduction in productivity. I'm sad that Jim Clern is not here today to talk about that. So he would do a great job of that. I always appreciate his insights on that. And then finally, uh, hatcheries are another stressor. John didn't talk about these. These have been kind of the band-aid for more than 100 years of, of how we solve the salmon crisis, which is more than a century or 150 years in the making. And we continue to invest. Our agency just announced major new investments coastwide in salmon hatcheries as a way of uh, supporting recovery 
there has been kind of limited evidence that that's been super successful. And the there are impacts on the life history, diversity, the genetics of, of salmon that are um, meant to be helped by this that I think need to be addressed better. So those are the, the major stressors that I wanted to remind you about, uh, that I wanted to address this question about what kinds of new science would help management in the system. These are in no particular order, but things that just came to mind. One is uh, there is apparently maybe some relationship between temperature and the flow that is occurring in the reds of the salmon related to the release of water from the dam. The um, laboratory studies that we've done show a very clear interaction between temperature and flow on egg to fry survival. And you can imagine that as you reduce flows to control the release of cold water to maintain it over the season, that this is reducing the river velocity and may have some effect on the velocity within the salmon nests. And um, towards the end of the drought, we saw the system operate in a way where the, really the summertime flows were at the lowest level observed and the egg to fry survival was quite a bit lower than it would have been expected from a temperature effect alone. So this does indicate something could be going on there. Um, actually, yeah, through an oxygen effect, but it, uh, understanding exactly how the flows change in a salmon nest is, is really hard to do because it, it depends on many, many factors, the depth of the water, the velocity of the water, the channel uh, shape, the, the shape of the, the red itself and groundwater interactions and all of this. So um, we need to know more about that. It's a very tricky thing to study. Then I think it would be useful still, and this is something we are working on, is try to understand better really what are the trade-offs between uh, the goals we have for water deliveries and for fish conservation. They're not strictly orthogonal. They're quite complicated. And um, some of you may have heard about this co-equal project that's being led by UC Davis that we're involved in as well that's going to try to provide more information on that. Uh, it's still early. Then I, I have some, some social science questions. I'm not a social scientist. So these may be really stupid because I don't know that much about it, but it seems to me that a lot of our barriers to having better outcomes for salmon are social, legal, or economic. And I'm wondering if um, you know some work could be done there to answer questions about how we might improve management strategies to help fish and overcome some things like just the resistance to any kind of change, even things that you think would be easy, like managing predators uh, are, are really, really fraught. And then um, some nuts and bolts things about engineering. I think getting salmon above these currently impassable dams is going to be a crucial strategy for achieving sustainability in a changing climate. We don't really know how to get adult salmon above dams without stressing them out, and especially how to get the juveniles back down around reservoirs at a rate that's high enough to allow for pop those populations to be self-sustaining. And then in thinking about the stressors and the science, one of the things I was really pondering on my drive up here this morning is what we understand and even know to ask about has to do with what we can study. So much has been learned in the last 15 years from acoustic telemetry, which has been very powerful, but it can only study fish that are maybe about this big. And the ones that are smaller than that are very difficult to study. There, there's a lot going on between the time they hatch and they become large enough to tag. There could be enormous potential there that we don't know really. So just getting more insight on that would be, I think, a huge advance. Uh, the technologies are improving all the time. So maybe we're gonna get there sooner than later. I think I'll just end with that. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for being so succinct. And uh, next speaker is Dr. Anka Mulasoga. Great. I also don't have slides, so I hope you can hear me in the back if I just stay here. All right. So as you. Oh. All right. So as you. Uh... Just heard from Peter Goodwin. My name is Anke Mueller Solger, and I'm currently the director of the USGS California Water Science Center. And I was the IEP lead scientist from 2008 to 2014, which means that for quite some time now, I've really not been much of a scientist, but rather in the science support position. So I can't help but talk a bit today about support for science. My point with this is that we need adequate and long-term support for collaborative and integrative science. When that's lacking, 
it's actually something of a stressor to the listed species and lots of others too. So on to question number one, which is about the most important stressors on the listed species. Um, I'm going to start at the very high level where the immense and immensely rapid landscape, hydroscape, and bioscape, if those are words, alterations made by the people of California over the last 170 years are the obvious causes of the decline of many species, including the listed delta fish species. These species are losing out in California's ongoing competition for, for water, the loss of their native habitats, and of the ecosystem processes that once sustained them. At the same time, some non-native species are thriving in these highly altered habitats and novel ecosystems in the Delta and elsewhere. And now climate alterations caused by people around the globe are adding additional stress. And you'll hear a lot about this this afternoon, I'm sure, as rising temperatures, sea level rise, precipitation changes, and also the rise in gigantic high intensity wildfires like the Park Fire that's currently burning near Chico alter the hyd hydrology and ecology of the Delta and its watershed. So zooming in from this really large scale view to the level of an individual Delta smelt or one out migrating juvenile salmon, the stressors that cause individual fish to perish may be one or more of the following. The lack of nutritious food or cover from predators, water that's too stagnant, too warm, too clear or too toxic, or a non-native predator that by eating this fish lets, lets it become a pre-screen loss after water project operations have entrained it into Clifton Court Forebay. At the population level, the most important of these stressors are, well, in my opinion, all of them. As shown by the IEP's pelagic organism decline investigations and many other studies, populations of listed species in the Delta are affected by a multitude of stressors and environmental drivers in combination rather than individually. These stressors can be organized into broad categories, such as altered flow regimes. And yes, John, river and tidal flows affect just about everything in the Bay Delta as they interact with other stressors, such as altered physical habitat, pollutants, invasions by non-native species, and climate change impacts. But the important thing is that none of them act in isolation, making the situation in the Delta very complex sometimes chaotic and always contentious, as several Delta lead scientists put it in 2015. So because of these complex interactions, I believe that it's not especially productive to isolate and rank these interacting stress stressors, although that's been tried. In my opinion, it's probably more productive to consider how project operations and other management actions contribute to and interact with these multiple stressors and how more sophisticated project operation strategies acting in concert with tides and habitat restoration can perhaps be used to lessen water project impacts on not just, not just the individual listed species, but preferably on the entire community of native species and their habitats. Regarding question two, uh, which was about new science, uh, I'd like to say that because of these complex interactions among, among multiple stressors that I just talked about, we need equally complex signs to understand them and to find effective ways to manage them and achieve the co-equal goals for the Delta. No one can proceed in high, uh, uh, no one can do this kind of science by themselves. Instead, this kind of science needs to proceed in highly collaborative and integrative ways that contain all types of scientific approaches that we pretty much can think of and some that we haven't thought of yet, many scientific disciplines, input from a broad spectrum of stakeholders, and close links to management actions through science-based adaptive management strategies, as is mandated, for example, by the Delta Reform Act of 2009 and called for in the Delta Science Plan and Science Action Agenda developed by the Delta Science Program and certain lead scientists under the unifying motto of One Delta, One Science. The backbone of the needed collaborative and integrative science and adaptive management is sophisticated, consistent, and also comprehensive long-term monitoring, including next-generation monitoring, such as, for example, with remote sensing or boat-based high-speed mapping, and perhaps some tools that we haven't invented yet to study these little fish that Steve was just talking about. Monitoring data can be used to assess and forecast the impacts of stressors and management actions through statistical, process-based, and conceptual modeling approaches. As has been shown, by, shown many times in the Delta and elsewhere, analysis and synthesis of monitoring data can also provide important insights into the causes of observed changes. But often, 
interpretation of monitoring data is just not enough. And hypothesis-driven research studies, experimentation, and integration into adaptive management strategies are actually needed to decrease model uncertainties, answer emerging questions, gain a deeper understanding of the causes of ecological changes, come up with management strategies, and fine tune the effectiveness of adaptive management actions. I, I was actually a bit surprised when I read the charge to the committee and saw that it only mentioned monitoring and modeling, but not research or adaptive management approaches, or for that matter, anything about collaboration or integration. Things are so complex in the Delta that uh, I think we really have to give it all the science we've got if we really want to understand what's going on and better manage it. So in my opinion, what's needed, needed more than some new type of new science, although that's needed too, is continued support for collaborative and integrative monitoring, modeling, and studies. Like, for example, the recent reclamation-funded physics to fish study that you've already heard about from uh, earlier panelists, and many highly collaborative studies conducted under the auspices of the Interagency Ecological Program, or IEP for short, which has been conducting cooperative ecological investigations in the San Francisco estuary since 1970. Monitoring observations such as, for example, the organism, uh, pelagic organism decline in the early 2000s and the development of new management strategies keep bringing up important questions that can only be answered through integrative research studies and experimentation. So these types of investigations, along with a lot of monitoring and modeling, have been an important part of the IEP throughout its history. In the last 20 years alone, the IEP has conducted investigations of the causes of the pelagic organism decline, studies in the Yolo Bypass, fall low salinity habitat studies, and analyses and syntheses of the effects of flow alterations and drought on the ecology of the upper San Francisco estuary, to name just a few. And by the way, I have a list of references, which I will give you later. Uh, in my opinion, the IEP has been very effective in bringing together teams of scientists from many agencies and disciplines to conduct coordinated monitoring, comprehensive studies, and complex modeling analyses and syntheses. For many decades, these efforts have really dramatically increased our understanding of the estuary. From my current vantage point on the sidelines of the IEP, it seems clear to me that the IEP remains vibrant with a diverse community of enthusiastic and knowledgeable scientists. I met many during the last IEP workshop in Sacramento, the annual workshop, and very well positioned to continue its important collaborative work on many important science topics relevant to water project operations and the COECO goals. But collaborative science efforts as large and long-term as the IEPs need a lot of long-term support and commitment from multiple entities which can never be taken for granted. I understand that at the moment, agency support for the IEP is a bit shaky. I'm not currently part of these discussions, so I can only hope that in the end, the IEP will persist as it has for more than 50 years. In my opinion, the reason that the IEP has lasted so long is really simple. It's simply needed to organize, facilitate, and promote the highly collaborative and integrative science we need in the Bay Delta. It's not perfect, but I think it works, and I hope that it'll continue to be supported as one of the mainstays of the One Delta, One Science community. Um, I can't help but put in a little bit of science, so I do want to bring up one important science topic that I think is especially in need of scientific attention and that I also happen to be sort of particularly into. <laughs> it's the question of what stimulates or suppresses different types of algal blooms, and more specifically, which management actions can stimulate the production of beneficial algae and suppress harmful algae. This topic has actually been studied since the early years of the IEP. For example, when two IEP scientists with the Bureau of Reclamation, Jim Arthur and Doug Ball, sought to determine the phytoplankton standing crop in Susun Bay, uh, if the uh, phytoplankton standing crop in Susun Bay could be enhanced by outflow manipulation of the entrapment zone location in the summer and fall of 1978. Results from this remarkable early adaptive management experiment, pretty much before the adaptive management concept even came up, were promising and part of early scientific contributions that later led to summer fall outflow actions. Since then, beneficial algal blooms have unfortunately generally declined, while harmful algal blooms, including microcystis blooms in the Delta and the recent heterosigma akashibo bloom in San Francisco Bay, have increased in frequency intensity and duration, which does not bode well for listed species and humans alike. 
Recent collaborative studies, including the physics to fish study, IEP drought studies, and SFEI USGS collaborations during the 2022 hetero sigma bloom, have shown the utility of collaborative and integrative studies that include innovative tools, such as remote sensing, uh, to develop new concepts of phytoplankton bloom formation in the Delta and Bay under a variety of hydrologic conditions and water projects operations. But conditions keep changing and one, much remains to be learned. So these types of studies need to continue and expand and need continued support. Uh, the third question was about managing the Delta as a larger system. And I have to say that I really appreciate this question because it's clear that many of the problems in the Delta don't originate in the Delta and can't be solved in the Delta alone. This is actually one of the main reasons why I decided to leave my job as IEP lead scientist 10 years ago. I wanted to better understand the issues outside of the Delta that play such a large role in determining the fate of the Delta. And my USGS jobs leading a statewide science program and center afforded me this opportunity. I already mentioned one of these issues earlier, uh, and that's perhaps one we're not going to talk about so much here, but in recent years, wildfires in the Delta watersheds have been rapidly growing in frequency, size, and intensity. They change the hydrology of watersheds and con can contribute large loads of sediment, organic matter, nutrients, and toxins to waterways and destroy riparian habitats. Sometimes organic matter inputs can lead to anoxia and fish kills. Wildfire smoke can also decrease solar radiation and suppress primary productivity in large areas. While the water projects don't control knobs that could directly prevent or manage wildfires, water project operators still need to understand the hydrological impacts of wildfires, as well as of increasing temperatures, drying soils, and a reduced snowpack on water supplies and listed species in a changing climate and adjust operations to reflect the new normal of greater hydrologic extremes and increasing wildfires. Working with the California Department of Water Resources, USGS scientists in my center are currently conducting a large study um, to better understand and forecast the water supply in the Feather River watershed, which feeds Lake Oroville, California's second largest reservoir. The study was in initiated after statistically based water supply forecasts overestimated watershed runoff into major reservoirs by 50 to 68% in the very dry and hot water year of 2021. The study includes the installation of soil moisture monitoring network and a process based and process based modeling of runoff and recharge with the USGS basin characterization model. It also includes a study of wildfire impacts on water supply that was added to the original study after 51% of the watershed burned in 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> At the other end of the hydrologic spectrum are very wet condition with conditions with atmospheric rivers as or more severe than what we saw in water year 2023. In that water year, a lot of the precipitation fell as snow and cool temperatures maintained the snowpack into summer, which provided water storage above reservoirs and reduced flood risks. But in future wet years, temperatures might be warmer and atmospheric rivers could be more intense. And I'm sure you'll hear more from Mike Dettinger and others about this this afternoon. Reconnecting the rivers that are part of the water projects to floodplains and basins, setting back levees, creating more large flood bypasses, similar to the Yolo and Sutter bypasses, and allowing flood water to spread onto agricultural crops that can withstand flooding, can decrease flood risks and help recharge groundwater, thereby storing flood waters for use during subsequent dry periods. The question asked about upper watershed down to San Francisco Bay, but the Delta is also impacted by what happens after water is exported from the Delta. For example, Delta exports have been used to counteract groundwater overdraft and land subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley and to provide water to urban areas along the coast. More sustainable groundwater management as required by California's 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and urban water conservation may eventually help reduce the need for Delta exports. But in spite of some successes, there's still a long way to go. For example, a recently published USGS modeling study by Claudia Font and, and others showed that in the Central Valley, groundwater storage and land elevations continue to de decline because rapid declines during dry periods continue to outpace recovery during wet periods. Tools like the USGS Central Valley Hydrologic Model and local model adaptations are critically needed to help local water managers and state and federal water project operators better understand, predict, and track the outcomes of changing conditions 
and develop integrative management appro approaches that include areas within, uh, uh, upstream of, and basically downstream of the delta, south of the delta. Uh, final question that I'm answering here is question four, but uh, which is about specific comments to the three actions in the statement of task. I'm just going to say that I don't have specific comments other than to reiterate that none of these actions can achieve their goals by themselves because they interact with each other and with other ecosystem drivers and stressors. And a lot of has been said and written about this sort of thing. Um, I'm just quoting here for as an example uh, with regard to OMR flow management, the IEP's flow alteration management analysis and synthesis team, long word, uh, which stated in a series of white papers published in 2022 that Mitigation actions only targeting entrainment drivers such as OMR and turbidity may prove insufficient due to cascading unmanaged synergies influenced by stressors and sustained perturbation. As stated previously, collaborative and integrative science and adaptive management is needed to improve and assess the effectiveness of these and lots of other management actions. This requires sufficient support for the full spectrum of science and ad adaptive management activities, including research studies, process-based research studies, hypothesis, hypothesis testing, and all these things, and collaborative analysis and synthesis efforts. In the Delta, we can't manage what we don't collaboratively monitor, model, and study. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> So we're now, go, we're now go down to uh, Dr. Luoma and then to Dr. Thompson, and then Wim, you'll have the final word. Thanks, Peter. Um, Laura asked me to talk about uh, contaminants here as well as addressing the, the five questions. Um, so I'll start a little bit with uh, talking about questions and then uh, then I'll get on to contaminants in, uh, in my 15 minutes. Um, the, the first question we were supposed to address is what what are the most important stressors? And um, I've got to say, my answer is the same as Anka's, all of them. We have been asking this question in the four decades that I've been working on this on this on this this uh, difficult problem of how to manage the delta. And I can't say that we have ever come up with a universally satisfactory and a universal answer that is satisfactory to everyone. There is a plethora of broad scientific consensus that multiple stressors have generated the problem that we see, problems that we see. I think Anka's done a good job, Steve's done a good job, John's done a good job of describing some of these stressors, so I won't go into that. What we're left with is a, is a, uh, is a what we described in 2015 as a wicked problem. Uh, it's a pro and what does that mean? That means a problem that doesn't have an immediate instantaneous solution. It means a problem that we need to address incrementally through time, persistently and progressively attacking each of the stressors. Of course, we need to prioritize to some degree, but over time we can do this. And I'll show some examples of, so I'll show an example of success in a few minutes. So we can't, so it just, it's, it's a little frustrating to see a focus just on the projects because so long we focused on the project effects and not on all these things together. So we can't only focus on the projects, uh, but we can't ignore the breadth of project effects either because the projects are involved in all of these stressors to some degree. So can I ask, can we put some sli uh, the slides up? Do I, do I have to, can you run them? Thank you, That's thanks a lot. And you can just go through to the second slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, the one thing that Anka did not mention is that the stressors that we're talking about, we've so many of us have, list, have listed, um, are also intertwined. Let's go to the second slide. Thank you. These are just quotes from a variety of sources that talk about the the, the support uh, for or that mention the support for multiple stressors. The stressors are intertwined and interact in in complicated ways. This is really important to consider when we start trying to use the data that exist to try to figure out the effectiveness of regulations that are in place. It gets in the way of of understanding those things. 
One of the most important thing, I, things I think to understand is the nature of this IEP data that we have. The IEP has collected, a, and, and a Jim Clarn and I have talked about this, and Jim looks at data sets from all over the world. He said, this is as comprehensive, as good a data set as can exist in terms of comprehensiveness with uh, constituents, in terms of spatial coverage, in terms of temporal coverage. I mean, my goodness, 50 years for some fish. But the other thing that our good friend, the late Bill Bennett, emphasized is that it's a time series and that it's from one watershed. And what does that mean? There are lots of coincidences, lots of covariance variants. So when we start looking at statistics, which we use to address so many of these questions about the effectiveness of things, those all have a great influence on what we find. And that's why I loved Anka's emphasis on more than just monitoring more than just statistical analysis, we need we need to ask uh, hypothesis based research, and we've done a lot of that, and we and we've made a lot of progress in that regard. Uh, one of the contaminants of most, and I think there are good examples of this. One of the contaminants of interest here is ammonium, which was uh, discharged from the uh, from the uh, Sacramento uh, waste treatment facility. Uh, for those of us who were around in 1986, I'll credit Jan and Fred Nichols here. Uh, when this uh, the, a strange clam invaded uh, Susun Bay, and immediately we saw a decline in phytoplankton, in phytoplankton productivity. A, a, uh, um, just it cut the top off the off the phytoplankton bloom. Uh, Jim Clarn's group, Jan's group, studied this and documented the importance of that clam invasion. About a decade later, it was also discovered that uh, ammonium discharged by the Sacramento waste treatment plant can inhibit uh, productivity of phytoplankton. Ammonium also correlated with the, some of the declines in productivity that happen in the Bay. Which one is most important? Uh, I sent to the committee, and I, I, I'm sure Laura distributed it, a paper by Jim, a short little essay by Jim that discussed uh, this, this, uh, the, the conf conflicts between these two explanations. But Jim's paper reminds us uh, the importance of going beyond statistics if we're going to separate coincidence from drivers in, 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 in understanding uh, such effects. And that misinterpretations can come from leaning too heavily on statistical studies, which we do lean on heavily here. Uh, and I think that's probably something that you all will keep in mind when you look at things like the IE ratio and things like that, where statistics have been important in, in some of the interpretations there. Statistics are this the, the, the nature of the data set also get affected by keystone events. Uh, Peter Moyle et al. in 2016 in describing the life cycle of the state of science with regard to uh, Delta smelt talked about uh, extreme, extremely high entrainment events that happened in the early 80s and in the, in the early 2000s, both of which they suggested might have been key in pushing Delta smelt to a certain population level that had trouble recovering from other stressors. That's a controversial conclusion uh, on one hand. On the other hand, it's not something you can pick out from the kind of relationship, the kind of statistical studies we've used in the past. And finally, things like fall X2. We don't see with Delta smelt, we don't see a, a relation, statistical relationship between, between uh, Delta smelt and, uh, and, and, the, and the way we uh, manage water in the fall. Uh, but again, uh, some of the IEP studies, uh, what they call the float studies have shown that if, if Delta smelt don't make it through the year because of high temperatures, for example, then they, don't, then they don't survive well in the fall. If we have a cool year, like in 2011, also a bad wine year, it's good way, that's why it's easy to remember that year. <laughs> but if they don't, they, they, there have been spikes in, in, in Delta smelt, in Delta smelt uh, recovery. Again, the, the, these, kind of, these kind of interactions interfere with statistical, with simple use of statistical relationships. And my only point is we have to use caution in how we use the data that we that we analyze these things. We have to look at these things in a more comprehensive way. And if, if we're going to manage the system, we also have to manage in a more comprehensive way. Managing comprehensively uh, also involves, as Anka emphasized, and I'd like to emphasize over and over if I can, communication, cooperation, and collaboration. We have gone through phases in this system where we have collaborated and it's collapsed. We lost time when it collapsed, in my view. We have, we're back in a phase of collaboration some while ago. I'm afraid that we're, I fear, I don't know if it's true or not, but I fear that we're heading toward another, 
another phase of this fragmentation. And I sure hope not, because as Anka emphasized, we lose, we lose time and we don't have a lot of time. Perhaps our most formidable stressor right now is the changing rate, is the increasing rate at which change is happening. And again, that's something that we, it requires flexible and collaborative management. Let's go to the next slide and talk about contaminants. And contaminants are a microcosm of many of these issues. Legacy contaminants we have in the sediments of San Francisco Bay uh, from a, a long history of industrialization, urbanization, uh, agricultural development. I think the lesson here is, is that we solved many of these. We've solved many of these problems. The Bay, when we started the first review that Jim and I wrote, Jim Clarn and I wrote in the early 1980s, we were having an oil spill a day and almost a fish kill a, bay, a, a day in the Bay. There were huge, uh, around uh, and some work with Jan's group and mine showed documented uh, community changes in the benthos around some of the waste treatment facility inputs. Only a couple of those have been studied, but in both cases, uh, Jam's group did a, did a great job of documenting how those communities changed. The Clean Water Act was passed in the 70s and it began to be implemented in the 1980s. And through the incremental progressive attack on point sources around the Bay, we don't have fish gills to speak of in the Bay at all. We don't have these hot spots of shown recovery. And again, that's, that's something that has been documented the, the recoveries have been documented in the literature. Has the Bay community improved? Well, we're not really sure because the baseline is changing all the time. But do we declare that the management is a failure because we can't prove that, as is often declared about management of the Delta? I don't think so. I think we can look at these successes and we should, we should be rec recognize these successes and build from them and recognize there's more to do. Today's management to a great degree is necessary but it's not sufficient. We have to do more. Selenium is an interesting one. This is directly, directly related to the projects. Uh, the, the selenium and the soils are the, I'm sorry, the soils of the west side of the Central Valley are underlain by a clay layer. The projects have facilitated irrigation of those soils. When they're irrigated uh, early in the year, water accumulates in the soils as the gas gets drier, as the summer goes along, uh, the, the, the uh, evaporation of the water extracts salts from the soils and concentrates that in the surface. Well, in order to solve this problem, uh, the Bureau was, I think the Bureau was obligated to drain those, uh, drain that area of the, the irrigation, irrigation water from that area. Uh, a massive project called the San Luis Drain involved putting tiles under those soils, collecting them in a drain, sending them off theoretically, or if, the goal was to send it to the Bay, but they didn't finish it. So they stopped halfway and put it in Kesterson National Wildlife Refuge. And of course, that was in the 1980s and one of the most famous ecological disasters in the history of the country, I think I can say safely. Uh, and it, I think it was just a matter of not knowing that one of the salts there was selenium. And selenium accumulates in food webs. It, uh, there were massive bird die-offs, mostly predaceous birds and also aquatic, uh, aquatic community problems uh, as a result of that. Uh, the uh, San Joaquin River was then left because we had the, 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 the drain problem. The drain was not the solution to that problem. The San Joaquin River was left as the receptacle uh, for that uh, selenium. Eventually, uh, we, there has been, I think, a, quite a bit of success in controlling selenium inputs to the San Joaquin River. Later studies have shown that, there, that, that the biggest selenium problem probably would have happened had the drain gone to the bay. We had, a, we had a source of selenium within the bay itself, which we were able to study. And Robin Stewart's studies uh, at USGS led studies showed that uh, first of all, selenium accumulates in food webs, primarily in benthic food webs. Uh, and again, John showed sturgeon up there in good year, in wet years and dry years. Well, one of the things that happens is that selenium concentrations in, in uh, both the clams the sturgeon eat and in, uh, and in the sturgeon tissues themselves are highest in the dry years and lowest in the wet years. But yet, sturges, because of this kind of tension between geochemists and ecologists and ecotoxicologists, they call people who work with contaminants, selenium still isn't considered when uh, most, of the, most of the sturgeon biologists look at, look at the fate of sturgeon. But that is, there, there are pretty high concentrations or there have been pretty high concentrations of selenium and sturgeon. The point is that if, that there's a huge reservoir of selenium in the Central Valley still. And some of the projects that we're talking about would swap San Joaquin River water 
for Sacramento River water. And if that selenium reservoir is not considered in that swap, it, 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 it poses a risk for San Francisco Bay. So that's one where we've made progress on the one hand, but is that progress durable? It depends upon decisions that are made in the future and continued investment in controlling that reservoir of selenium uh, from, getting to the, from getting to the bay. The next one I'd like to talk, the next one of these that I'd like to talk about is pesticides. Let's look at the next slide, please. This is an interesting graph, graph from, uh, from Fong et al. in 2016. This is state of the science with regard to contaminants, a review that was done in that year. Uh, on the left are Delta smelt, is the Delta smelt population in, index. And it's uh, drawn as a function of pyrethroid insecticide use in the Central Valley. Pyrethroids are a uh, are a, cl a class of insect or a class of insecticide that is not as persistent as the organochlorines used to be, the one the DDTs etc. Et, et but uh, do do associate with sediments and so can hang around in ecosystems longer than this other kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, of contaminants. Now we could draw from this the conclusion that pyrethroids look like they're pretty important uh, in delta smelt populations. Actually, nobody's drawn that conclusion. Uh, partly because of what I talked about before, the covariances and everything else in the data set. On the right, here is uh, pyrethroid use. Uh, the red dots, you, you can ignore those. Those are organophosphates, uh, a different class of pesticide. The, the graph does point out that the lifetime of pesticides is about 17 years. Some people claim that's because of regulations, but actually it's because insects develop tolerance in about that period of time. So we have to move on to a new class so we can get rid of them. Uh, but the the blue dots are uh, are uh, are the the use of pyrethroids, and right about the time that's uh, the, the the vertical line there is about the beginning of the pelagic organism decline, which I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, and that's just about the same time as pyrethroid use took off. So we also know, interestingly enough, that there are benthic community changes in in uh, for example in one of the places where pyrethroids are most concentrated, Cache Slough, very valuable. Uh, uh, delta smelt habitat, community changes there that have been associated with pyrethroids. There are uh, indicators of uh, uh, biomarker indicators of stress on on uh, on delta smelt from that area that have recently been published. Uh, and so we can't certainly can't ignore pyrethroids as a as as a, as one of the as as one of the uh, stressors with regard to delta smelt. Although it's one of those things where Contaminants are always mentioned, but rarely is, is, is this plot or any of this even discussed. So again, I think the point, again, the point here is that this is a contaminant that we can't, this is a stressor that we cannot ignore. And it, that is, that kind of point is, but we can't prove that it's, that it's the stressor because it's, it's interlinked with so many other things. So I think that we can say that about a lot of, about most of the stressors that we're talking about. They're taxa specific, location specific, we can't ignore any of them. All of them are important. We must manage them together. Let's go to the last slide. And so these are, with regard to future management, these are the things that I would say. Simple one-dimensional solutions don't exist. Let's not pretend they do. Management should evolve and is to some degree beyond question, should evolve beyond and is to some degree beyond questions that focus on the projects and on ranking the most important stressors. Those are old questions. I think the questions of the future are, are more important. This is a wicked problem. That means incremental, flexible approach to multifaceted ecosystem management. That can only happen if we communicate, collaborate, and cooperate. But I also think we need to be positive about the progress we have made. This idea of declaring management a failure because we don't see the ultimate solution to something when our options are so narrow is just a, is itself a failure. You need to be positive about the progress we've made, but realistic about the challenges that lie ahead and they're formidable. I also think the greatest impediment in this system to moving forward more flexibly and more rapidly than we have is a deficit of trust and communication among <laughs> our factions. As I said before, we've gone through times of where trust is built and we've gone through times where it's fallen apart. Um, we have been in a time where we're building trust. I'm worried we're falling into a time where that's falling apart. Collaboration and cooperation are slow and frustrating. 
but they're a necessary part of a path toward actually timely, effective, sustainable management. So if there's a message that this committee could send on, <clears throat> excuse me, from, my, from, my, from me, that message would be the importance of collaboration, cooperation, and communication amongst the factions here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah but we were going to say, go through, but let's take a 10 minute break now, if you don't mind, Dr. Thompson, and then we'll come back. Um, I'm happy. <laughs> take a 10 minute break by talking to a question. I hear you. <laughs> Uh, and 45. Yeah. 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 You ever dream about that no. stuff? Or no.
Just how complicated this because this thing is yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so like to I thought you should title it. Someone like the cold. They do. I like that. Baby. What's that? Oh, you got a funny one. Okay. So what, what's the feeling about the ammonium suppression of dietary production? Is that still people thinking that's Jim thinks it's a, well, but Jim is very a fan of it. There would never be recovery unless ammonia was spread well. But ammonia was a which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I think it's we're in some way, but I think it's unlikely it's happening. And this happened so it was a step functional effect as soon as the plant. Yeah, all the things documented, you know, there's a six of which infiltration, all those things. But, uh, and so, so the, the statistical side of showing the performance, and, and I just, uh, a couple of years afterwards, uh, probably they tried to show some, uh, some recovery happening, but it was really okay. As we look at started, we have several speakers, and then we'll the go experiments to underway. Many questions. Cut it out. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Thompson, uh, go up. <laughs> Okay, go want to sit down again. I don't blame them. <laughs> um, so I was asked to talk about the uh, benthic community, and uh, I'm going to concentrate on the part of the benthic community that uh, this group is most probably most likely to be interested in, and that is in the combined house of protected key uh, food web of the system. And I have included this just because I really think you do it understand and remember, yeah, you know, we talk about the biohouse, but there's a ton of things other than biohouse in the benthic community, some of which are really important to fish because they're fish foods like amplifies. So um, we at present are looking at clams because they consume phytoplankton and zooplankton. They're consumed by higher level predators and is as Sam just brought up they become a contaminant vector to those higher level predators. So uh, the benthic community has uh, several, okay, I've got to figure out how to get there, right? Uh, with like the, the what? Yeah. Oh, that's easy. No. Show me some, like no. arrows in the Arrows. Oh, there's arrows. Do you think the arrows are working? Yeah. There. All right. So um, I'm, I'm cutting my talk to two questions. What, because I think that the state of the science is not known by most people. Um, the benthos is mentioned as a, a pain in the you know what, because of the phytoplankton problem, but then they move on. And the other is, um, I think there's, I have a recommendation for how we can deal with the phytoplankton versus um, benthic grazer questions through modeling. Um, I will show you. Uh, this is this is a plot of current and previous on the upper left uh, stations that are sampled by DWR. This is an amazing data set because it started in the seventies. Today they're sampling ten ten stations at near monthly uh, intervals. That data is totally analyzed and taxonomically uh, verified. So that data has been remarkably helpful in our understanding of exotic species that have moved in and when. Um, in addition to that, partially in response to what Anka is saying, uh, the special studies in addition to those 10 stations was 
uh, a cry from several of us, including, I think Alan Jasby finally made the largest impact on, can you tell me the spatial pattern of benthic grazers in the system? 10 locations in that big of an area is not enough. So the, the bottom graph, bottom map, shows uh, a number of things, but first thing it shows is that between 2007 and 2018, DWR sampled 175 benthic stations twice a year. That is also an incredible data set. So we have spatial data on the benthic community twice a year for 10 years. I'm showing you um, the result of that for one, it's in October, I think 2010, of the grazing turnover rate of the two major plants. And I've done this because I want you to understand they're both exotics and they overlap. They overlap because of salinity. One's freshwater, one's estuarine. So if you increase freshwater, the other, the corbicula increases and in a drought, the time of corbulate increases. So uh, the question with flow and clams is sometimes a wash. Um, the difference between the clams is one of the corbicula lives two years, corbicula lives five. That makes a difference because it's um, salinity stress of the recruits is around uh, salinity of two, which is why they overlap at X2, which is kind of convenient, but not, not convenient. Um, they're, because they live longer, corbicula becomes much more tolerant of salt as they age can still be in down bay areas two or three years after a freshwater event. So they can handle salinities of 10, some say 15. The time of corbula, uh, we keep seeing them in freshwater as adults. They can handle as, as recruits, but they can handle them as adults. So This is one of those uh, 175, 175 stations on the left-hand side. Um, the USGS has worked with DWR on converting clam numbers to clam biomass and grazing rate, which uh, we were uh, situated to do and DWR was not. So we've worked closely with them actually for the last 20 some years. Uh, the map on the right is a map produced for numerical modelers of what the grazing rate was during that one month. It took four people many months to get here. 175 stations is not enough when you're trying to interpolate uh, over greatly changing depth and also that little problem of grazing rate goes to zero on the edge. So we start declining as we get closer to the edge and the realities we should be increasing. So it, it's a very difficult question. Now, the other, the, I have worked with modelers for a good portion of my career. There is never enough data. It does not, I mean, I could do 475 stations and it would still not be enough data because we could not get the spatial scale that, that they want. And they certainly don't want it every six months. So we have to come up with another way to do this. Um, I am now re retired and there's no one doing what I did before, which is taking this data to biomass and the grazing rate and talking to modelers and being able to talk to the modelers. So um, at present, I'm trying to come up with ways. Of, I, I get several phone calls a month. Ways that we can at least come to the table and discuss what we're saying. This is based on a paper that I wrote with Lisa, Lisa Lucas, who is a modeler. And it's just a way to conceptually think about benthic grazing as a function of how long the water transport time, the time the water column is over the, the clams, and 
how the phytoplankton respond to that. The top, the green part is very low grazing rates. Top one is zero. And it, and it shows that uh, the phytoplankton actually increase in biomass as, it, as the transport days increase. And that's because there's nobody removing the phytoplankton. The exact opposite happens when you increase the grazing rate to 10. So the longer the water column is hanging out over the, the clams, the lower the phytoplankton biomass. This is to those of us who thought about phytoplankton and the bottom is like, yeah, um, it's a good way to get people who haven't thought about it as more than a one dimensional problem or at least a two dimensional. And it's not a two, it's a many dimensional problem. So my, um, recommendation is a little complicated, but I think it's worth looking at. This is from a different paper that Lisa and I wrote. And, ah, oh, handy, but it's all right. The, we've taken benthic grazing rates in locations where we had irradiance data, where we had um, depth and so guessing on zooplankton, sorry, Wim. Um, it's their standard one per day. Um, and estimated what the effective growth rate is in those relation, in these locations based on the grazing rates and those few factors. So it doesn't include transport. So this is saying red dots are where it's loss dominated. Those of us who've studied the benthos can tell you that this is in the northern and southern end of Mildred Island, and it's definitely loss dominated. They, they're getting a daily, how many hourly delivery of phytoplankton to them every time the, the, the pumps turn on. The green dots are where it is growth dominating. San Joaquin River is definitely growth dominated. We do not get corbicula in the numbers that we get it in other places in the system. Then it's, these are all corbicula. These are not the estuarine clam. Then it starts to get very interesting in some of these locations. This is Frank's track. It's, this presentation is a really good way to say, well, it's working, except I know that's not where we get a bloom. Can we look at transport? And in, in some instances, it's just the canal connecting to a, a zone of productivity. But in this instance, yeah, we know that Frank's track, at least in these years, was loaded with clavicula and it was therefore um, loss dominated in that system. To go further up the Sacramento River, it's loss dominated because of depth, if nothing else. It's really deep. And the way we introduce depth in this is the grazing rates are normalized by depth, which is the only way you can compare one, graze, one grazing rate to another one is to make sure you've got a normalized by depth. That's how depth is introduced in here. And that's why you have a uh, loss dominated phytoplankton in the Sacramento River. And in the confluence, uh, again, it's, uh, growth dominated because corbicula don't do so well in the salt water. So if we, this same map would look quite different with potamocorbial. It's just one idea of how to bridge the gap between the data and the modelers without going to a full on numerical model with ecology. We've been there, we've tried to do that. That's incredibly difficult in this system where everybody's already described the fact that uh, there are too many factors, there are too many factors that, that interact to come up with any way to actually get to a numerical model that includes the kind of variability we expect with the crazy. I'm gonna stop there, if that's okay. That's good. We'll catch up. Okay. Well, thanks, Matt. Questions for Tom? So the final word from this panel, if you want to be at the podium or just set up. Well, I have some slides, but I'd like to, yeah, rip, rip it. Like, uh, 
like Sam did. Um, yeah, well, um, thank you all for still being here. Um, so the questions. I'll go through the questions first real quick, and I have a short little presentation, um, mainly focusing on uh, lung fin smell. And so the first one about uh, stressors. First of all, I don't really think about stressors. I mean, I think about stressors like contaminants as that's a stressor. You know, if you're going to poison something, that's a stressor. If you're going to take away its water, that could be considered a stressor. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we have to be concerned about that doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really fall very well into that, that uh, box. And so I tend to think in, in terms of conditions and processes that influence populations of interest rather than stressors per se. Um, uh, listed species kind of focus, for, for us, I focus on stressors because people are worried, well, what's doing, what is screwing up Delta smell? You know, what stressor could that be? Well, not just a stressor. Um, food, for example, of which Delta smelt are direly short at least I think they are. I don't know if there are any, any left, but um, but it's not a stressor, but it has a huge impact on on most or all animal populations. And Jan just showed you why um, when you when you bring in a new a new benthic grazer that's fairly tolerant to salinity and extremely fast filtering and fast reproducing. And it's pretty much there every year at some place in the estuary without fail. Um, you're gonna make a mess of things. Especially if that clam lives in the low salinity zone, which is also habitat for a lot of young fish and a bunch of other things. So it's pretty much an overriding impediment to success and restoration, at least some, at least of the pelagic fishes. Um, and likewise, the spread of Immersed in a, and floating aquatic vegetation, which we haven't heard much about or anything, I guess, um, in, in the delta, in the, in the freshwater parts, mostly freshwater parts, is also a severe impediment. You go up in the, into, I think, if you go up into uh, the Cache Slough complex, especially this time of year, you'll find Aguirre just everywhere where it wasn't there so much uh, three years ago. Um, so that, that limits your ability to restore physical habitat because restoring physical, ha physical habitat is the great savior, supposedly, the great uh, way of getting around the need for more fresh water. And that would work fine, I think, if it weren't for the fact that anything you do in shallow water is gonna be covered with water, water weeds. Um, so salmon are Steve's domain, Delta smelter is only gone, and so my focus is on longfin smelt, and <laughs> um, because there's still enough of them out there. Um, as an aside, we spent uh, some wonderful nights out in the, in the uh, area where longfin smelt live, which is not in the Delta. It's in Sassoon, it's Sassoon Bay to San Pablo Bay, at least this year. And, um, and we, we caught about 1,400 of, of a little larvae. So they're still out there. Um, so what do we need? You know, what science do we need to do better? What science do we need more of? This sort of, I've seen this happen. This hasn't happened today, but it, this kind of discussion or kind of question almost always, always gravitates toward whatever I do. Right. You know? <laughs> so, but I'm going to break that. I'm not going to talk about zooplankton. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so... Uh, you know, for delta smelt, we have lots of knowledge about them, probably more knowledge per unit biomass than for most other fishes <laughs> yes. um, that are still extant, if it is. Um, Longfin smelt, I'll talk about. Um, if you could milk, if you could manage the delta as a larger system, um, up the watershed to, down to San Francisco Bay. Well, Anka and I collaborated on a talk to the, in, in the state of the estuary conference, you were out of town. You were in Germany. Baby, um, <laughs> or you had a baby. That's what you did. <laughs> you did something. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a long time ago. Um, anyway, this talk uh, was about it's it's one estimate. Yeah. The fish don't care about the bridges. 
They don't care. We care about the bridges, but the fish don't. So we have these dotted lines on maps, but the fish don't care about those either. And uh, so I gave this talk, it was very well received and, and utterly ignored since. Uh, so uh, then pelagic organisms like, like small fish and plankton live in a movie frame of reference. If you, if you want to know what they're doing, you have to sample them and think about them in their frame of reference, not our geographic frame. I'll talk about that a little more. Um, oh yeah, um, there was a, a question, what sentinel publications that support your physicians should the committee be aware of? Uh, and I, I had to look up the definition of sentinel because I, I, <laughs> I thought I knew what it meant. It turns out I did. It means, you know, somebody's standing with a rifle keeping, keeping other people out. Right? <laughs> uh, we're looking, keeping an eye out. And, and, you know, a, a good publication is more like a jailbreak. You know, it's, it's, it's the one that says, yeah, but here's this, you know. Um, and, and furthermore, there are something like 2,000 papers to, to choose from. So the one I'm going to pick, okay, it's one of my own. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I sent you the reference. Okay. So it's Kimmer and Gross, 2003, Esprit and Posts. About long thin smelt. Now I'd like to switch to slides. Yeah, there it is. So this is the canonical picture of the decline of the of long thin smelt. And John already showed this. This, this, this is the, the fall midwater trawl index of long thin smelt. And I got to do a little arrow. So we want to know how this works. I mean, this is a long scale, so it's a huge decline. It's a 150-fold decline over time. And there's a dynamic range of about 100-fold between high and low flow periods. So there's a couple of things to notice about this um, in the details. So it kind of bounced around for a while. And then in the late 80s, keep that in mind, there was a big decline. Well, that was a drought, a series of drought years, and it's also in Potemacorial Earth. And then it bounced back up again, and people went, oh. Well, guess what? These years were a bunch of high flow years in series. So, so in the drought, long fin smelt was at the bottom of its dynamic range, and in the wet years, it was at the top. So that looked like a re rebound. And then suddenly, there was a series of wet and dry years. Well, droughts interspersed by huge flows. And people called that the pot. Well, that's not the pot for long fin smell. <clears throat> and long fin smell is kind of the, the canonical pod species. Oops. Sorry. It happened here. And I thought I had a few other graphs in here with this, but. Let me just tell you that, well, John showed this, broke it up into the flow pattern and the, and the long-term pattern. And the flow pattern is a continuous decline that accelerates. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if anybody knows why it accelerates. Um, could be a stock recruit thing. But then this pattern, this flow pattern, is consistent throughout the entire time series. And so you have you have three things going on. There's a there's a flow pattern. There's a declining pattern due to uh, well well there's a there's a short term flow two things really short term flow pattern and a long term decline. Um, and you can separate. Them. So all right, suppose we want to well we wanted to figure out what to do about lump and smell. Suppose we could use flow to override some of the effect of the long-term decline. And I think that's possible. And I'll explain why. I think I'll explain why. Um, so we are studying, we have a big grant. We being me, Ed Gross from RMA Incorporated, brilliant modeler, um, and uh, some people from UC Davis, 
uh, Sean Acuna is involved in this, a whole bunch of people involved in this. And, um, and we're, so we're trying to figure out how this flow response arises. We know when it arises. We know when in the life cycle. It arises in the spring when they're larvae. And about, so I've done some analysis. I'm not going to show this because it takes too long, but um, this, this flow effect arises in the larval population around May is not there in the early larvae. So it's, it's not an egg thing or a hatching thing or any of that or responding habitat. It arises in, in May-ish. And I say ish because the data we have are not that robust for, for figuring this out. But if it arises in May, we should be focusing in May. Uh, so, so what happens to, to long pin smelt after they hatch? So we're, we're studying this from, from the perspective of modeling their movements using particle tracking and sampling them in the field. And we're sampling them with, uh, and we're going at it. Um, every other week we're going out, we, we went out this, this past spring and next spring and sampled near surface and near bottom, sampled day and night, a whole lot more sampling than, 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 the, um, than the routine model. Not, not a lot more sampling, but just more focusing um, than the routine monitoring does. So this is uh, data from a particle tracking study. This is not actually about long face and all, but it's, it serves, serves the purpose. So particle, passive particles that don't uh, behave, do, do anything vertically other than just float around. If you, you release them here, and a month later, their center events was down here in San Pablo Bay. Now, if a larva was doing the same thing, just randomly floating around in the water, it would be in San Pablo Bay, but it's not, okay? Um, by the time they're about, Let me, let me just finish that thought. Uh, so, so here's the rearing area for long pin smell. The overall, overall year is rearing. And so they're going to be seaward of that area. But if we, if we um, want them to stay put in, in the brackish water they actually rear in, we have to do something different with the particles. They have to go down. And if they go down, you're stuck in the low salinity zone. Well, that's cool because that's where the long pin smells are. This is this is the this is data from the long-term monitoring, the, the uh, 20 millimeter survey of, of the larger larvae during during uh, later spring into summer. And their center of mass is at a salinity of about two to three, but right in the low salinity zone. That's also the center of mass of Eurytemera carolidae. It's not a fence anymore. Um, it's um, the cocoa palm. And, but their abundance has gone way down. Um, so why does it matter where they are in salinity space? Um, well, you know, they're perfectly capable of handling salinity of 20 as, as late March. So why is that a bad place to be? I think it's this. Oops. I skipped over. Yeah. Um, it's the risk of predation from possibly from anchovies. And we don't think of anchovies as predators, do we? <laughs> but uh, actually, this is uh, this is two uh, calculations that I did of population clearance rate. This is kind of I have to revise this. This is an old slide that I had. I'm, I'm in the process of revising this study. It's kind of complicated. But um, two different ways. One is from individual clearance rates from a couple of lab studies. And the other is from bioenergetics from a couple of uh, studies done by Steve Brandt. Um, different anchovies, different species. And what you see is that at salinities above about 10, the, the population clearance rate is about 25% or 30% per day. That's a mortality rate. What fish can withstand that mortality rate as, as a larva? None. So that's very dangerous territory. Um, 
And so we're we're working on that. We're working on trying to figure out how how that flow effect works. And we're pretty sure it has to do with the fish going down. And last spring we found that during the day, they're all down to the bottom. I mean, not all of them, but greatly uh, divergent catches. We caught 400 in one tow down here. Just patching this like that, we hate, but uh, that's, what, that's how it is. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about, which is uh, to come back to the idea of, of the uh, <clears throat> how our terrestrial brains think about this system. We think about it like this picture, a map. And when we think, when we, when we work in this system, we're thinking about, okay, I'm at this latitude, I'm in the middle of Sassoon Bay, it's this deep, the sun is shining, and so on. And what about a fish? It's 95, it's late on the ebb tide, everybody around here prey on me, and there's not too much food. Their environment is incomprehensible to us. It must be incomprehensible because nobody seems to comprehend it. It's, it's water. They move the water back and forth. All, of, all the people who say they think like fish, they can't think like fish. We can't think like fish. But we have to think about how a fish can behave and how it can move a fish or other pelagic organisms. Uh, I'm not talking about flounders here. Um, how they uh, how they move and how they how what what is in their environment that they can actually respond to. And one thing we do know is they're smart enough to know which way the water's going. So that is that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We'd like to thank all of the presenters. And we've now got a little over half an hour for questions. And I'd ask the committee members if you could use your name tense so that if you have a question, please stand up and we'll get around to as many questions as we can in the time. So clear seatbelts. Perhaps we'll work our way along. See, would you like to go first? Well, I, um, just one little point. Well, I think I really liked your, uh, your presentation. Uh, uh, I would also think about those fish vertically migrating because if there's any gradient at all, they're probably going to do a diurnal vertical migration. Have a slender gradient, light gradient, perhaps temperature gradient. So you might think about that. Yeah, they, yeah, they do. They they're they're um, more dispersed through the water column. Could, could you uh, repeat the question? Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, Steve's question was about uh, vertical migration and, and other vertical movement, uh, diel vertical migration, and and sorry, what was the other part? Just vertical migration. Just vertical. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like they do migrate vertically. I don't. They don't seem to care about the great the vertical gradient. They seem to be able to go through the gradient without any difficulty. Now, so can the copepods. They just go up and down, um, and and uh, so they so they migrate. Uh, the copepods migrate tidally. Um, the uh, the long pin smelt larvae, as far as we can tell, um, migrate uh, diurnally. So they're up in the up. They're dispersed more throughout the water column in the in the, in the uh, night, and they're more concentrated near the bottom by day, which is kind of what you'd expect. So my overarching question to anybody is, and it's an observation. And I think Jay and I have had this observation for a while. You know, when, when people talk about flow. Well, I think you used the word flow. I don't know that anyone defined it. Uh, hydrologists define it as cubic feet per second, often, uh, or maybe even acre feet or something for the volume. Fish cannot detect flow. Right. And, um, and fish detect things like velocity, for one, and maybe the residence time comes into play in terms of uh, biological impact. And, and I'm just wondering if it's valuable to start thinking about this and being very specific about whether you're talking about velocity, residence time, or the uh, water people's definition of flow, uh, which is meaningless to fish, you know, certainly can't detect it. And I think that is there any way to start looking at science from that perspective to find out uh, what might be the more direct impacts on their fish? Yeah. So uh, I have to I have to distill Steve's question down <laughs> into into. Um, when we're talking about freshwater flow, that's not something that fish can detect. 
except Steve's fish can detect them, detect it, right? Yeah. When, when they're in the river. You define them. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Volume flow rate. Yeah. It's velocity. Uh, uh, so a whole bunch of correlates of, of, I actually have a diagram of this, but um, I published like 25 years ago, <laughs> but it's still true. It's, um, yeah. So there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of correlates of freshwater volume flow rate that, you know, so I think of the extent of the salinity field, degree of stratification, which is tidally driven, but but affected by flow. Um, also, you know, flows in the tributary, velocities in the tributaries, um, transport rates, things like that, and where the clams can be, uh, you know, affected by the salinity field, um, compression of the salinity field, which has a huge impact on on uh, and water depth also as they interact to affect the the, the extent of two layer flow, um, which is why. We're really keen on the Carquina Strait area where it's very deep and studying that. Um, so I think that I, that, that's probably about it. Yeah, there, there are lots of correlates of flow. And the ones that we know about from our perspective are different from the ones the fish know about. And, the zoo plank of the and they all know which way is up, which way is seaward, and which way is it going. Sure I, I'm sure of that. Yeah, so maybe we'll go to John and then Steve. You probably have something to add after that on the yeah. fish. No? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a good question. The units you use to describe flow imply, imply something intended or not about the mechanism that's involved. So, right, we used to, we still focus a lot on X2, which is great. It's a, you know, ecological representation of volume of water coming in to freshwater coming to the estuary, but people took that to mean that the fish, all of them, care about salinity. And I don't think they do, <laughs> right? Um, that's not what was intended by using X2. It was an elegant description of a single variable that described, uh, assimilated a lot of ideas, but people took it as, as salinity. If we talked about velocity, right, then, I mean, when I talk about velocity of of, of flow rates, um, people are like, well, that's increasing migration because the fish get pushed downstream. I mean, I've, I've watched fish swim in a, in a glass tube, right, to, to create laminar flow, and they will find any non, you know, any non laminar flow, put their nose on it, and just sit there and not swim at all, no matter how much you increase the velocity. So it's trying to bridge the what we're calling flow with management in a way that doesn't imply mechanisms that may apply to some things, but don't apply to other things. It's, it's a sticky wicket. Um, also, um, you know, even cubic feet per second, like I presented some slides um, that were in cubic feet per second over a four or five month period. There's no average cubic feet per second, right? And in fact, it's the variance that really matters. Um, I like to talk about things in thousand acre feet because it doesn't imply, you know, when the flow is going. But everybody's got a different preference for um, units. But it is it is a, a, a subtle and important problem how we talk about flow. Well, also, as the further you go seaward from the est from the delta. Um, or seaward from the, where the fresh water is, where the water is measurably fresh. The further you go seaward, the longer the time scale for the system to respond to changes, in, sudden changes in flow. So you can have a big, you know, a big freshet come down the Sacramento River, um, or a, a release or something, and and you won't see it in Sassoon Bay for for quite a while. Um, I've got sea story about this. Yeah, just a quick comment. That's a great point. Uh, salmon don't care about the bulk flow. It's the interaction of that flow with the channel form. And we've done a lot to change those channel forms. So the salmon are interested in depth and velocity and gradients in those things. And you know, we've converted complex channels into sort of trapezoidal things that are probably not good, uh, at least for some life stages of salmon. And I think we overlook that often. I didn't really mean to say anything, but since you're calling on me, <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, I, I guess I'll point to this, uh, this, uh, this report that I mentioned previously, which was actually based on lots of 
uh, individual publications, but this physics to fish thing. But there is this thing in there about the Lagrangian to Eulerian uh, uh, ratio, which I don't like the name at all. But uh, what it basically means is the, uh, the 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 ratio of the length of the tidal excursion to the length of the channel, and uh, and that sets up gradients that are actually really important, and that can set up areas a bit upstream that are have high residence time and then areas below that that have greater exchange with the channels around them and uh and and then uh the tides change spring neap tide cycles for example and these the, this ratio changes and things are exchanged um and then they they you know we're going back to neap tide and then uh, there is a greater chance of uh, of of accumulation of biomass in the areas with greater residence time again. So all these, and, and so this is flows, both the inflows and the tides interacting with the landforms, the landscape, uh, the, the, the channel configuration. Um, and all of these things really have to be considered together. And the fish exist in all of this and probably perceive it all differently, uh, but they do know this when there's more food around, <laughs> say, uh, or, or, or other such things, or, or you know, uh, any number of variables that are affected by this. Anyway, it all kind of comes together, but tides, flow, river flows, and the interaction with the landscapes is, I think, what really matters. Yeah, thank you. Do and then come back to Jane? Uh, this question, I think, is for Steve Lindley. Um, you mentioned that you thought that resistance to change was a really big impediment to the system and that that included resistance to managing predators. I would assume that means non native predators. Yeah. I was just maybe wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. That surprises me because in the Colorado River, we love to remove non native predators because then it allows us to ignore the greater problem, which is, well, <laughs> yes, like I say, I, I have been surprised too. Uh, anecdotally, you know, so striped bass are are notorious now as being a major predator for juvenile salmon, and we've got more and more data to show that that's the case. Um, and they're a non-native species; they were introduced 150 years ago or something like that. Uh, there's a very uh, important sport fishery for those fish, and this was kind of surprising to me because I also work in marine fisheries management and people are usually fighting for more fishing opportunity. They want less restrictions. But in this case of the striped bass, a, propo a proposal went forward to the Fishing Game Commission to reduce or remove uh, bag limits for striped bass. And uh, people from the fishing community came out in force and completely killed that. They wanted the regulation to maintain their striped bass fishery. Thanks. I think that uh, Jane? It's clear that, that we think about this system very differently depending upon where we sit. There's a, there's a wonderful thing in bureaucratic theory it's called Miles Law. Have you heard of it? Where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> um, and it applies pretty much to everybody. Uh, and it's sort of like this old or Larry and Lagrangian thing. Uh, there's another sort of analogy you can, you can take to sort of administrators think about these problems in, in Eulerian terms. You know, I'm, I'm in control of this territory, whereas the real problems are sort of Lagrangian there, big network problems. And, and so when we have a scientific question, we, we, we want to go talk to a scientific expert no matter where they sit. For our scientific expertise, but if we want money, we have to go talk to administrators because that's their here. Sam, and I, I think also uh, Anka mentioned the importance of collaboration. How do you get these administrators that are in charge of different territories and budgets and people in the West, uh, that collaborate over time and, and the, the ebb and flow, the wet years and dry years of collaboration, <laughs> floods and droughts of collaboration are, are really important for sustaining or disrupting the scientific activities that we have and the effectiveness of the scientific activities in terms of management. Um, what can we do to support and sustain as, as put it, collaboration among factions? So if you want to go first, perhaps you can paraphrase the question for the folk participating online. Yeah, to paraphrase the uh, 
the last of what Jay, Jay said, how do we how do we facilitate collaboration among factions in a, in a, in a group like this where factions often have a lot at stake and, and differ amongst each other? And there are there are ebbs and flows, but how do we sustain that? And I, I don't think there's I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, I th I think where well I I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I think somehow it there has to be one one way would be uh, top down. In other words, there's a centralized force that insists on collaboration. But that's not what we have here. We have a polycentric man management system uh, that is at the extreme. So where are we when we have succeeded, that was essentially what CalFed was. CalFed was was a, a a system that was put together by Bruce Babbitt as part of the Water Accord, Bruce Babbitt's Department of Interior, and it was a a California federal collaboration that had a centralized pot of money, a centralized uh, a centralized. Uh, group of people working together on a series of common goals that were put together. The common goals turned out to be give every, give somebody, give everyone something. Uh, and that, and then it, it, that exploded or imploded, I should say, after about, I don't know, it was a decade of the water record in that, but about five years of CalFed and the politicians got, or people got bored with it or thought it wasn't moving fast enough, which collaborative things always appear to be slow. Uh, so, so that centralized approach did not work. I think what it requires is a, it, the only thing that I can think of is, is a philosophical dedication. Well, let's let's take an example: the co-equal goals. We have agreed in California to 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 have co-equal goals that we manage toward environment and water supply reliability. We've agreed on that, and it's law. If somehow we can agree on collaboration and communication as an essential as essential to the co-equal goals then i think we can get the agencies and the and the stakeholders to participate because you know it's a lot of fun to play in the sandbox but if you don't want to get sand on you then you don't go then that that entity is not going to is not going to be there so i i think i think somehow it's a it's a you don't have to have authority in the in the hierarchical uh, suite of things if you have moral authority, which the science program, which has been ongoing since 1999 here, the science program has never had any authority, it's, it's, but it has had moral authority because people have essentially agreed that science is a core around which we need to build management of this system. It's a difficult, com technically complex problem. So that's a lot of mumbling around, uh, but, I, but I do think that, but I do think that, uh, that, that this moral authority and this acceptance, this broad acceptance that communication, collaboration, and cooperation are essential to ongoing management of this challenging, what we call wicked problem. If we can accept that the same way we accept co-equal goals, then I think there's a chance that this can continue forward. This is against, to some degree, human nature to want to consolidate power, but, uh, but, but I think that's the only thing that I can think of. Maybe others have better ideas. So, so we're getting to the question, do you have anything to add just from your perspective of how long the IMP for so long? Sure. Any number of things. I think it also emphasizes this is focused on the scientific enterprise, not on no, I decision guess. making. Yes, absolutely. Science, thankfully. Uh, decision making is hard. I just want to acknowledge this. Managing these resources is really hard. And, and as scientists, we have this obligation to produce science that actually helps managers, at least as scientists in this sort of uh, agency and applied science context. So I just want to acknowledge that. But <clears throat> for science to actually get used by those managers, it really has to be three things. Um, and this is not me saying this. There is a whole bunch of papers about this. I can provide them if needed. But one thing is it's got to be credible. It has to be high quality and quality controlled, and people have to feel feel and understand how credible it is. The second one is, of course, the obvious one, which is it's got to be relevant. So one can look into all sorts of things, but if they cannot, if there's no management knobs to turn, for example, uh, if there is no, uh, if, if there's no clear uh, application to what these managers care about, it won't, won't happen. And then the third one is the trickiest one of all, I think, which is that it's got to be legitimate. And that is something I've been thinking about, like basically forever at this point. Uh, but it has to be accepted as 
as something that is done by this particular group of scientists following this particular method, the scientific method, uh, in order to provide something to another group of people. And, and uh, that is, I think, where a lot of our problems lie, that people think, you know, there's too much partisanship uh, or that the science isn't uh, represented correctly or something, and it's just not legitimate the way it's coming through. Um, the credibility often also plays into this. But, but anyway, I think that that's a really big one. And then uh, another thing that I've been thinking a lot about and by the way, I did give a talk at the uh, most recent IEP annual workshop um, specifically about collaboration and cooperation. And uh, the, the uh, by the way, the history of uh, scientific collaboration is actually pretty fascinating. I looked into this, where it started, which is, by the way, France, uh, at least in a big way, and then how it migrated around, et cetera. Uh, from sort of these these individual folks like you know Mr. Darwin or whoever uh, that were these naturalists that did things kind of by themselves mostly, uh, but then these uh, networks grew and they grew in, in France anyway. Sorry, I'm a bit off on the tangent, but it's so fascinating. <laughs> and in France anyway, they grew because of under Napoleon because of war needs, which isn't so different yeah. from management needs of today, and that you really had to put a bunch of scientists on that all together to provide these ideas about how cannonballs can fly straighter or whatever it was. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, that, that's where it came from. But then there was this collaboration and there's also cooperation and there are some differences between the two. And to me, the biggest uh, difference is that when you collaborate, and I always liken it to an orchestra, which has a common score, uh, you have this common goal, common plan, common rules, common resources that anyone here, and I'm sure absolutely everyone here has done this, uh, has when they start a research project, right, or any sort of scientific co collaboration. And then the collaboration ends when the goal is met and the resources are used up. And then there is, of course, and more science is needed. So we apply for more grants, right? But anyway, that's how that is. But then cooperation, uh, I liken to a drum circle where there is uh, no one score, but rather independent scores that people have in their minds. Uh, but there is mutual consideration, consideration of each other as we're in that drum circle. And there's mutual benefit, which leads to some really cool music that's coming out of this, where the whole is greater than the sum of its part. But they can have different goals, you know, uh, in terms of how that's really supposed to uh, work out exactly. And this whole thing can keep going indefinitely. Doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have a get an end. As long as there is mutual benefit that people can see and mutual consideration, it can keep going. And I think the problem is that this mutual benefit and then the 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 willingness for mutual consideration is something that's hard to see and hard to do. And then it comes and goes and falls apart again. But I think as far as scientific collaborations, there is no other way. The problems are too complex these days, as I talked about. We cannot do these things on our own. And in order to be truly beneficial to managers, and again, management is hard, uh, you know, uh, we have to really all work together and work with the managers in these adaptive management or whatever you want to call it, um, constellations. Yeah, this, this is not the only problem that People have faced, or society even has faced, that has these kind of complexities. Nope. No, no. Nope. Military cases, nope. public health, transportation systems, design of cars, making sure everybody drives on the right or the left, and in which country you're on, it's different. You know, and the scientific aspects that come out of all of the air, aircraft safety. But maybe there's something we can learn from some other groups problems where we have been much more successful than we are being now. Although I will certainly agree with, with, with Sam also that we've made a lot of progress, but to make more progress, I think we need to step it up. Okay, thanks, Jay. We'll keep moving through the questions. So back to your next, and we'll come to it, Albert. Great. So thanks. And thanks again for the presentations. They're really great. And uh, I wanted to float an idea by you to kind of see if it's been done already, if, uh, how it might be looked at into what just to Sam that I'm a statistician, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not <laughs> um, uh, One of the things that I'm noticing uh, in, in all the talks that you've been given, including the ones here, is just like the um, analogy of the elephant that people are viewing from different points of view, mm -hmm. right? And everybody's talking about 
you know, some people are talking about the front, the other back end, and so on. And um, so as a statistician, I like to think about how to look at that. And of course, one way, and it's been brought up, would be uh, like an ecosystem model of sorts. I've done that, they're very complicated, they take a lot of time. Um, but one thing that they serve as is, is uh, as a focal point for everybody to look at. Uh, uh, the, uh, the children's story that I like is um, Stone Soup, where the Russian uh, uh, army is, is returning to home and they're in the city and, uh, and uh, they want some food and nobody will give it to them. So they put the giant pot out in the middle of the, of the courtyard, uh, heat it up and start putting stone, stones in it. And everybody begins coming to that. What are you doing? We're making stone soup, but carrots would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a spatial temporal modeler, so I think about that and I'm seeing a lot of time stuff by itself, a lot of space stuff by itself. And I'm wondering, uh, I think an ecosystem model would be nice, but it would take too long. Could we do something like have <laughs> maps that are basically time bearing? Each one of you bring your own map to the situation. You put the map down and, and we kind of see where things overlap. Yeah. Would that get a discussion going that would be helpful? I mean, you mentioned Napoleon Tufti, which has really visual presentations of things, has the, the map of Napoleon's march in it, really, and you know, the size yeah. of the of the army right. as it's marching to Waterloo and then back in uh, in the winter. Uh, and so I can I can imagine that there would be a situation where we could bring different pieces. As long as we knew what to bring, uh, it might be interesting to see the, how the clams over, overlap with some other element of the system. So this is a wicked problem, but it, it requires inter, um, uh, you know, interaction and interdisciplinary discussion. And you know, I bring my diatoms in and they don't have any effect, right? So that's a useful thing to kind of <laughs> see. And you know, maybe something else is you know, uh, more important there. I'm wondering if that's been tried already, or, uh, or would, would something like that be helpful, or how might we uh, bring something like that up? So that's a pretty big question, and in the interest of time, maybe we can just do a quick uh, response and then carry that over in the break. Um, I don't know who wants to start, Jen. You may want to talk a little about Cascade. Which was one of the previous, just very briefly, or papers still coming out. Yeah, papers are still coming out, but it, it was an effort um, <clears throat> to go from climate to um, phytoplankton, essentially. Um, and yes, that what you're suggesting is useful at the, from my experience, the early stage of a model. Um, I think it's a little harder to do it maybe with fish. I'm struggling with how you've, maybe it's because I'm overwhelmed with fish, but I'm not sure how you would do that with fish. And that seems to be what, I mean, bottom line, that's what drives the, the system as far as regulations. So, um, but it did help us understand a lot of things, but we, we for a variety of reasons, did not finish everything we, and one of the things we didn't finish was the, the ecological part that included grazers and phytoplankton growth. And that wasn't our choice, that was an administrative choice, let's just put it that way. So um, I don't know, I, I think certainly I've done that. I've done that a fair amount. People have asked me to bring in Maps of, I mean, and I, my comment is you can have whatever you want because if it helps somebody understand it, it's, it's pretty, Subject it's very visual. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, should we have a win and see if you've done that with one of the, so perhaps you could both comment on the question. Yeah, I, I've been involved in several sort of smaller scale modeling efforts, um, including some of my colleagues here. And it's, it, but it's always focused on a particular problem, a particular thing. When you start talking about the system, you're you're dealing with, well, for the estuary, you're dealing with a gradient, you know, across which 
everything changes. You know, the species are different. The, the, the processes are at least quantitative. And I tell you, and, and so, so that, and it changes differently depending on antecedent flow. So, um, so you know, you might be looking well, like, like we do. We go, when we want to find something, we go chase it according to salinity. Um, but that only works up to a point because you have stratification. You know, this, you start bringing in the the what ifs, and it starts to get pretty unwieldy. There have been quite a few modeling efforts aimed at phytoplankton um, and and integration of phytoplankton and physical processes, and, and much less going even even into zooplankton, partly because there's a, another step in there which we'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's right? Yeah, a couple of things. So I, th I think we do have a lot of pieces here. So we, we can think about conceptual models. A lot of those have been developed. I don't think there's really one that maybe for the whole system. Um, and then we have more detailed mechanistic process-based models. The thing we've developed for, for Chinook salmon, which has space-time habitat dynamics in it. But a lot of other things then by necessity are simplified. But we could start kind of hanging these on a larger conceptual framework of conceptual modeling and maybe even link those together with um, like Bayesian networks to get at a more complete picture of the system because it is very unsatisfying. Um, like working with our winter run Chinook model, you can think about how you might change the system and what would happen to the, the Chinook salmon, but it really is relying on everything else sort of staying the same and everything else is going to change too. And we don't have a tool for that yet. At least I don't. Yeah, go ahead. But just one thing, maybe Denise can comment on this too, because we do have a set of conceptual models that cover many aspects of many ecosystems that Denise was pretty uh, remarkably, had a remarkable job of leadership in pulling this together with some of the agencies. But we do have a number of those conceptual yeah. models already there, but they've never been pulled together. And I think that effort is, I don't know what that effort ended up being other than published. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, something you said struck me. There's a lot of, um, I think there's often confusion about the relevant time step. And that's, I'm sure I could say the same thing about the spatial step, but I'm thinking about the time step now. Like we spent a lot of time uh, modeling the effect of old and middle river flows as if velocity on a 15 minute increment mattered to the fish. And I just could never understand that. I don't think it does matter um, to them in that way. In that way. Um, getting to the units of flow again and what's actually driving the fish. Um, similarly, like there's a lot of discussion about flow impacts on harmful algal blooms as if the flow in the moment before the bloom forms is the, the, the moment you see the bloom is the flow that mattered, right? Like clearly there's a population growth curve that you're not seeing, right? So, um, I mean, there are good reasons to have different time steps, but I've seen a bunch of confusion over what the time step is and added to that, and this is a comment on what Wim presented, um, for the fish at least, part of their ability to exist as semiparous fish, right? Many of them, they spawn, they die. So that's a big gamble. And, and the way that they um, meet, uh, mitigate the effects of that gamble is to spread their life histories over time and have, mm -hmm. right? So like longfin smelt, like spawn over months and their larvae are there for months. And the main effects may be in May, but like don't discount April or March, right? Because there's a lot of larvae hanging around then too. So anyway, it's 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 complicated as you knew. <laughs> yeah. But I, I appreciate the well, yeah, Dalva's question. I think Charlie, you had a- Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, since I like Jan's comment. Um, so we have state agencies and we have NGOs and we have water delivery contractors, but overlaying on all this is federal government. And uh, perhaps uh, an impediment to collaboration and cooperation is uh, administration priorities or agency uh, leadership priorities that can kill a program like Cascade pretty quickly. So I just didn't pay for the comment committee, but some 
note that requires a federal commitment as well as sort of local collaboration and operations. I think really important. Okay, thanks. Right, and for those of you, if you didn't uh, who are participating online, Dr. Bales was just highlighting that additional complexity with the federal government and federal priorities that could come through Congress or from the heads of agencies, and that's a, a shifting landscape. Um, Sabina, before you have Albert's question, are there any questions from the committee members online? Maybe you could be looking for that while Albert asks his question. No, yeah, okay. Nothing, Thank you. Great presentations. My question builds on on that, uh, and the uh, on the need to understand interactions of key priority players, um, maybe through maps, maybe through modeling. Um, but you know, think about fish, and I think our charge is pretty difficult. But at the very basic level, level of fish, our native fish, you know, want to eat, eat in a food limited plastic and avoid being eaten in a place where there's many non-native fishes, right? So we try to understand the effects of, of water flow or their crossing of mechanism for their velocity residue and so on on these two things. I think I thought this, that's why I think about it with limitation and, and predation pressure. So I think we understand pretty well the effects of the of flow um, on the on the non-native consumer part of it. But I'm wondering what's your opinion and I think in particular uh, to, to win uh, about the effects of, of drought or low flow conditions on the uh, on the food limitation. Uh, part of the equation. I think you mentioned uh, submerged and chlorine um, macrophytes, and I've seen those of the Egeria, like um, water ferns that they create these you know, huge layers that, that prevent uh, you know, life from penetrating and so on. So like, do we understand uh, that and potential interactions between uh, these um, macrophytes and, and the Asian plant, for example, are we you know, do we think that that's a similar ecosystem shift to the one we saw in the 80s with the plants? Why don't you paraphrase the question just very briefly when, before you respond? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Albert's question is, um, let's see if I can paraphrase this. <laughs> is it, is, is, um, well, we've had two major shifts in the system. One was the invasion of the Sam Corby, the clam, and the other is the more recent in invasion, essentially, of, of freshwater, shallow freshwater habitats by, or regions, I don't like to use terms like that, but like shallow regions by uh, non-native vegetation. And is there an interaction? I don't, I think not, because they're, they're physically, you know, they're spatially separated. So the clams are mainly in channels and mainly in the Tamacorbula, mainly in the Chancho, in brackets to saltier water. And the SAV is in shallow water that's pretty much fresh. Um, so I think they're and they and the problems they bring in are really different. So the clams are basically consuming the phytoplankton, the microzooplankton, and the and the nauplius larvae of the copepods. Um, so there's a direct and an indirect effect on the higher growth levels. The uh, vegetation is pretty much blocking out places. That, that could be used as habitat for things we care about, uh, fish, and also um, causing other problems with uh, you know, biochemical, biogeochemical problems or, or alterations of the biogeochemical framework that no doubt have knock on effects, but I don't know anything about that. Like inhibiting growth by making it darker. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. There's, uh, I, I've been wondering, oh, I, I sort of expected, I think I actually expected this out loud once, um, <laughs> that when the sewage treatment plant in Sacramento River quit discharging ammonium into the system, and then, and then most of its nitrate, that the SAV would dive back. Um, okay. Hasn't happened. <laughs> Nothing happened, really. As far as I know. Yeah, actually, I had that same discussion with um, macrophyte ecologist from USDA uh, Agricultural Research Service years ago, and he said, "Nope, won't happen because there's so much in the sediments yeah. that they draw on um, oh, yeah, 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 that, right. that it's just not going to." Anyway, uh, but I actually really didn't want to say that. I wanted to to um, to mention that. Sam's journal here, the San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science Journal, had its first volume of this year, 2024, 
that dedicated to drought. It was actually a special issue on the effects of drought on the ecology of the upper San Francisco estuary. And it has, I think it's five papers or so uh, that were authored by members of the IEP's drought mast. Don't even ask what that means, but it's the drought uh, basically analysis and synthesis team that the that the IEP has. And and I think they're really good papers. Mm -hmm. They're they're you know, uh, looking in, in particular on specific topics like harmful algal blooms and the SAV are in there, et cetera, but they also give some overview. So I draw your attention to that. Mm -hmm. Any other panelists want to respond to the question? No. Uh, Faber, did you have a, another question? Well, I just said I wrote group one for anybody or everybody. I was surprised that nobody mentioned steel that thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably my art. Uh... Yep, that website. Uh, <laughs> I say salmon, I mean salmon. They're salmon. They have the same kind of issues. There are many nuances in particular. Steelhead are just too complicated to study. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people study prophecy, though. Yeah. You say something that's just right. right. Okay. So, with that, we are at noon for the lunch break. Uh, I'd just like to thank the panelists for. Not just the presentations, but the amount of effort we put in for preparation and for a list of the Sentinel and other publications that we have. So, why are still like not even the same? Do we get lower? Oh, okay. They do actually. And they also. And again, for participants, if you wish to make a comment in the open mic session, so uh, later this afternoon, please sign up outside. If you're online, then you should put a note uh, of your affiliation in the uh, chat. Yeah, yeah. With that, we'll reconvene it on the other side. We solved every problem. <laughs> There's plenty of different ways. Yes, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yes. But just in terms of the oh, research. Research.
Unless you'd like to come up, uh, John, good to see you. This one, right? Well, I don't know. I just want to check and make sure we're still connected. I off and I cannot I think we're ready to get started again. Welcome back. And the first session we have this afternoon is focusing specifically on climate change. Uh, for those of you that weren't with us this morning, what I'm going to do is to introduce each of the panelists. And they're going to give a brief presentation, and then we'll open it to the floor for questions from the committee, first of all. And if we have time on the agenda, we'll then open that more broadly to participants in the audience and to those online. We'd like to welcome everyone to this session. Uh, we've first got uh, climate researchers, and also those leaders in agencies that are responsible for mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And we're going to go through on the panel uh, as listed on the agenda, uh, starting with Dr. Michael Bettinger, who's a visiting researcher at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the Center for Western Water Weather and Water Extremes. He retired from a senior research psychologist with the USGS in 2019, after 38 years, but has continued to be very active in the field. He's working on Western hydroclimatic variability and extremes, and many of you will know he was one of the instigators of the term at the Storage River, which is now in the common left uh, He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Association of Advancement of Science, and a member of the National Academy of Engineers and is recipient of two California Climate Science Service Awards. He was the lead author on the Water Resources Chapter of the 2013 National Climate Assessment, uh, amongst many other things. He received his PhD from UCLA. Our second speaker will be uh, Dr. John Durand from UC Davis. He's a research scientist of aquatic ecology at the UC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences. He received his PhD in ecology from UC Davis and studies the ecology of food webs and fish in estuarine environments and the restoration of transitional zones across terrestrial aquatic interfaces. He met as a team of scientists and students working on various projects in the California estuary, including two long-term ecological studies of fish and food web ecology in Sassoon Marsh and the North Delta. In addition to research, he teaches in courses on a wide range of topics from fish conservation to graduate level class in marine ecology.
All right. That will move to speakers from the Department of Water Resources. I believe that Andrew is going to take the lead in this presentation. Um, Andrew is the California State Water Project Climate Action Manager. He works with the State Water Project Management Team, other state agencies, public and water agencies, and scientists to reduce the state water projects contribution to climate change and drive action on adapting to climate change risks facing California's water systems. He has held a range of senior positions within the Department of Water Resources and the Delta Stewardship Council. His expertise is in climate change impact analysis, management solutions, and policy development. He's a graduate of the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona. Aaron Miller is the manager of the Water Operations Planning Section for the State Water Project at the California Department of Water Resources, where he leads a team of engineers in developing annual operations plans that inform the State Water Project allocations, forecasting delta water quality for real-time delta exports, forecasting the Oracle cold water pool management, providing support for efforts like the long-term operations. He's a licensed engineer and graduate of Humboldt State. We also uh, have Eric Reyes from the Department of Water Resources, who is manager of the modeling support office within DWR. He's held multiple leadership roles across DWR and currently oversees modeling related to water management and was a big part of the Cal Light and the update of CalSIM. He's also a graduate of UCLA. The final presentation we'll be hearing is from the uh, experts of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, Dr. Drew Looney, Loney, Loney, civil engineer. Oh, sorry. I feel loony most of the time. <laughs> oh, geez, um, he's a civil engineer with the Technical Services Center Applied Hydrology Group. His focus spans the water management and dam safety disciplines, providing technical expertise, senior review, and project management of reclamation activities related to hydrology. He works collaboratively with the Reclamation Bay Delta Office, Modeling Division, and guides an integrated modeling team spanning hydrology research, uh, reservoir operations. Yeah. Finally, but certainly not least, we're joined by Dr. Levi Brecky with the U.S. Bureau of Reclam Reclamation. He's Senior Advisor for Research and Development in the Bureau of Reclamation. He provides executive oversight of all aspects of Reclamation's research and development programs and data management activities for the Reclamation's workforce. He serves as Senior Leader for Reclamation Communities of Practice in Climate Change, Hydrology and Hydraulics. He serves as Reclamation's Office Program Manager for the R&D programs, overseeing innovation efforts for reclamation engineers, scientists, as well as external collaborators to develop solutions for science and technology in the areas of water infrastructure and environmental issues. As so part of those responsibilities, he coordinates research related to climate change and variability. He received a PhD in water resources engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. With that, I think I uh, introduce everyone. Um, and we'll turn first of all to Dr. Okay. Thank you.
So um, <clears throat> I was asked sort of to uh, brief you on climate change. And I fiddled with it a while and decided that the fact of the matter is, if there's anyone in the room who hasn't heard an awful lot about climate change by now, um, in terms of water, just to narrow it a little bit, in terms of California water, narrowed even more. Um, this isn't necessarily the talk for you. I decided to go ahead and uh, and rather than try and take you through all the things that are going to be impacted, can you guys hear me by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, to focus on just two main things uh, that I think um, we need to be thinking about right now. And so, snow isn't one of them because we've been talking about that for about 35 years. So if you haven't, if you aren't already on that, guys, we got an issue. Um, but um, just a couple of things that I think are particularly important. Many of you, this you'll already know these things because if you listen to the governor talk about water, he generally brings these two things up rather than snow these days. Um, and, but I just want to give you a perspective on them. Okay, so ooh, ooh, again. I finally see what was going on. The arrows don't do a damn thing. <laughs> More than okay, the yeah, space click car. on Oops. the screen. Um, What's that? Click on the on the screen and then um, uh, and then Things I have to use. I eventually get the hat. And I'm still not. Yes, I think. Oh, okay. With the uh, okay. <laughs> so, like I say, a lot of this you guys have gone now. But it's my job to drum it into you a bit more. Um, first of all, California, uh, main thing to bear in mind is California has an extremely variable precipitation regime. This uh, map shows the uh, coefficients of variation of water year precipitation across CONUS, across the continental US, with those blues and blacks being areas where you see the standard deviation of water year precipitation divided by the mean is uh, anywhere from 0.5 to 0.7, which is to say that the standard deviation, not two standard deviations or something like that, but the standard deviation is 60, 70% of the mean. So that's huge variations. And as you go up in the state up north to where uh, CVP in particular uh, you know, lives, you're looking at numbers that are still three, 30% to as much as 50% variation as a standard deviation, which isn't, is not to say the, the extremes, that's just to say and normal variations. And California is really the home to that. It's a California thing. Um, this was a, an update that I did a, a couple of years ago um, using the PRISM data. But basically, I want to drew it back to note that I, uh, using the PRISM data as opposed to the, the co-op station data up there in the upper right, I could come up with about 40 years of good responsible data. Um, and, I'm sorry, 80 years of good responsible data. And that was enough to uh, suggest to me that, okay, with 80 years of data, I should finally be able to say something about whether or not the variability is changing. And um, so over on the left there uh, is the first 40 years of that 80 year period. And the, on the bottom left is the second 40 years. And then these two white and red, white, blue and red um, maps here are the differences, okay? The, the one up here has been masked to, uh, to for, at a 0.5 uh, uh, significance level, and to um, detect changes in, say, standard deviation, you really want a lot of data. That's why I waited until I had about 80 years. Uh, and then this one here is not masked for significance. And our main point here is that uh, I've seen an awful lot of blue there. And the blues are the places where the variability, water year variability is increasing. 
And so you see that, you know, really for the US, um, and this is actually global, but for the US, our variability that, that uh, and, and a lot of blue over California there, our extreme variability compared to everyone else is increasing still more. Okay. Um, so extreme variability in California, getting more extreme. <laughs> Don't say oh, yeah. read the top there, but this is a uh, a way of trying to understand where that variability comes from. Okay, and in the sense, the black curve here is a five year moving average over the total water year precipitation annuals. Um, you know, over the whole delta catchment, which is to say the Central Valley catchment, really. Um, and then the red one down here. Is going through and finding the, the, the historical um, upper fifth percentile daily precipitation and asking how much of the total water is coming from that, those, that upper fifth percent of uh, fifth yeah, percentile uh, levels of precipitation, those largest storms. And if you compare the red curve to the the uh, black curve, you can see that even the little ticks and the like line up really, really well. The green is all the other 95% of wet days plus the dry days where they don't contribute. Okay. And if you don't like five year moving average, five year moving averages to help you kind of see the little ticks and everything line up, or you don't like wiggle matching. A lot of people don't like wiggle matching. Up in the corner there, what's cut off there is in red and, red and green are the unfiltered annual values that, are, that went into this plot here. And the red ones, again, are that the largest of the large storms. Um, and it's, you know, that's contributing a lot of variance. Um, and it's plot, those are plotted against the total precipitation, annual precipitation on the, on the x-axis. And then greens are a fatter cigar laying flatter and so, you know, they're not only are they not as contributing as directly to total precipitation, but they aren't as predictive of total precipitation. What you need to get the total precipitation really is the big storms. They control whether a given year is a drought, whether a given year is a wet year, whether a given year is a normal year. I may seem really obvious, but again, this is a California thing. I move over to Utah or to Oregon or to, to Arizona even, uh, it's not that way at all. The largest, I mean, the normal storms really drive things um, uh, as much or more than the largest storms. So in California, if you want to know how the year's going to go, well, for instance, a drought year, if you want to know it's going to be a drought year, you count the number of big storms you got. The other storms, they kind of come in whether it's wet or dry, at about the same number of amount of contribution each year. And looking to the future, um, these kind of off the top on all these, but um, basically over here on the right, on top we have a bunch of projections, climate change projections of total California precipitation. You know, different colors or different uh, mo climate models and the like. Uh, from 1950 over there on the far side to 2100 over on this right side, okay? And if you kind of do all these different uh, projections, what you have here is you end up with some of the models getting wetter overall, some of them getting drier overall. The average it tends to be pretty darn close to, to uh, no change, all right? In the past, you know, over the past four um, IPCC cycles, we've seen that same sort of thing. In some IPCC uh, cycles, we get a little bit more precipitation, you know, so 5, 10, 15 percent more. But then come along the next uh, IPCC uh, set of projections, it's a little bit less, or, or you know, so it's kind of flip flopping back and forth. And for the longest time, this was a source of great frustration to the water community here. Because they want to know, are we going to have more precipitation, stream flow and stuff, or less? And we just couldn't tell them. We still can't, okay? <laughs> but what we can tell them as we dug in deeper was if you look at the biggest storms, and then 
which is the middle panel. And then if you look at the, the smaller, you know, everything else down here in the bottom panel, what you find is that the models, uh, there's a very consistent trend in the, in the projections across, well, I'll show you essentially all of the climate models um, that the large storms get larger, okay? And their contribution to overall precipitation gets larger. Um, all the other storms put together actually get smaller. And this is very consistent from model to model. Uh, well, yeah, it's very consistent from model to model. So over there on the left is a difficult uh, graphic, but the real point is here on these lines that of the uh, 20 of 20 projections that I looked at in this particular paper over there in uh, SVUs, uh, 20 of 20, 100% of them showed small, smaller overall uh, other storm contributions by the end of the century, okay? And 16 of 20, 80% of, uh, of the projections yielded uh, larger um, extreme storm contributions. And that business of not knowing which, whether we're going to have more overall or less overall comes down to which of these two trends, these two projections ends up winning out. Okay, if the if overall the extreme storms increase more than the other storms decline, then you got a wetter world, wetter California, and vice versa. Okay, there's the only snow figure I'll show you. And that's just as a combination from from the changes in the in the uh, precipitation that fall on precipitation in general. Plus, as it gets warmer, we're talking about less snow, more rain, the earlier snow melt. Uh, here's what happens to snow droughts in, in the uh, Sierra. Uh, with the blue here being Southern Sierra uh, numbers and the red being Northern Sierra numbers. Uh, red because the Northern Sierra, which feeds the CBP, um, is the lower part of the Sierra, warmer part of the Sierra, and the uh, Southern Sierra or the High Sierra and the Cold Sierra. But basically we're looking at numbers by end of century that range from under best conditions, least greenhouse gas emissions, Southern Sierra, High Sierra, only about a doubling of the number of snow droughts. A um, couple, couple of different pathways lead us to four times quadrupling of the number of snow, snow droughts. And Northern Sierra under the more extreme, the greater emissions, it's nine out of 10 years. At that point, it's not a snow drop, that's, that's the new norm. And the funny, the odd one that shows up once in a while is the anomaly, okay? So anyway, as it says up at the top, maybe for me, our future floods and droughts will also be wild. Just say, I just I showed you that our big storms are gonna get bigger precipitation-wise. Our runoff and droughts are going to uh, get more extreme also. And now I'm changing years, really. Um, and you can't see what I'm changing to, but I'm, up here we've got the, uh, for the San Joaquin drainage, which is basically San Joaquin Valley and Southern Sierra, uh, we have a, the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, which, you could read us the thing that we can't see. What does it say there, the copy? Is yeah, it says California droughts have been intensifying over the past few decades. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's Sorry. actually, it was useful to, to read. Um, and I hope you can see that something's going on that way. This one, I think a lot of people feel this. I'm just showing you that here's a simple old fashioned drought index that, uh, boy, it shows up pretty clearly. And we just note that, that year there, which I believe is like 2015, maybe 2014, I'm not sure which one, is down to minus eight PDSI. When we used to do the PDSI calculation on our projections of climate change out at the end of the century, we occasionally get numbers like that. And I can tell you every time I said, that's not even, I mean, that's physically not possible. I mean, at some point you can't get any drier. That's physically not possible. But there we see it in, in the record. This is observational data going into the PDSI calculations. Um, same 
diagram up there at the top, but I would note at this point, what's the PDSI? Well, it's a combination of precipitation, how much water is coming in, and uh, temperature as a proxy for evaporation and the like, so how much water is going out. Um, and um, so all I'm doing here is comparing the temperature and precipitation in the, uh, in the black oval to the temperature and precipitation uh, at a water year level in the, uh, in the, in the uh, red oval. And that's what's shown in the bottom here with temperature on the x-axis and um, precipitation on the y-axis. There's 90 plus years in the black there, black dots. And the last 33, I think it is, years in the red. And um, it just you know, there's a lot of dots and that sort of thing. And you may be able to see that the precipitation isn't really going up or down. But the green, yeah, sorry, the yellow arrow is about what is the 90 plus year average temperature precipitation is at the butt end of that arrow. And the, uh, the 33 years more recently, uh, temperature precipitation is at on the uh, wide yeah, okay. head end of the uh, of the uh, uh, yellow arrow. So basically, that's just showing that of the things that go into the PDSI, there's almost no change in the precipitation. This is all about warming. Yeah. It's warmed by about uh, two two degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, same diagram. Now I'll just say, I'll read. More, broad, more broadly, California and much of the nation's evaporative demands have increased over the past 40 years. And when I say evaporative demands here, I don't mean actual evaporation or evapotranspiration. I mean, how much water is the atmosphere, the, the conditions in the atmosphere trying to suck out of the landscape? And in particular, how much would it take from a well watered lawn? Think of your favorite uh, golf course, okay? So if the water is not a limited, not the limiting factor, how much evaporation are you going to see? And that's what this ETO critter is here. Um, and you can see the mean, the, one, the operative map is the one on the left there. And you can see the uh, northern and well, Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley uh, lighting up there. On the order of on the order of about eight inches more demand by end of century. Um, oh. No, I'm sorry. These these are observations. Anyway, over the past forty years, the trend has increased those by about eight eight inches on it, uh, generally speaking. But the whole of California is sitting underneath that pink, which is. Uh, almost half, so four, four-ish, six-inch, six-ish, or something like that, more demand. So this is part of a big pattern. It's not some weird thing about our data here. And in fact, this is based on going back to five very different modern data sets to make sure it's not just one flute flaky uh, data set. This is for real. We're seeing this increase happen <clears throat> over the past 40 years. <clears throat> um, and let me read. And more warmth and more uh, evaporative demand are on the on their way from climate change. Really, the, the operative one here is on the, the right. These are projections in a seven mem seven climate model ensemble uh, projected changes in this uh, e this evaporative demand for by season: winter, spring, summer, autumn. And basically, there's a lot of brown out there on this diagram, which is on the order of 10 to 20% more uh, evaporative demand this and by the end of the century. Okay, so large storms getting larger, other storms getting drier, which is a world that is generally feels kind of droughty with these interruptions of really big storms, which may sound like a good thing if you think about floods and, uh, and the impact they can have. And generally speaking, we're looking at increased demands uh, at the, well, in the mountains, in the, in the watersheds, but also down at the bottom and where, where uh, things like CVP and a large part of the SWP uh, customer base is. 
Uh, we're going to be having to deal with that, and we've, we've just shown you that it's already we're already well into it. So now I'm going to that was facts, facts, facts. Honestly, God, it was all facts. Now I'm just going to uh, dump a couple of ideas on you. That's the other thing that we're asking for. Um, and this is where I can never say these things as a as a survey employee, but I haven't been a survey employee for about five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it says California water resources will have to rely more on capturing extremes. Water from floods and storage space from drought. I might have said that as a survey employee. And you can see sort of my, my little cartoon here. And now I would argue that an awful lot of our, well, pretty much the way that we manage water at large scale in California is that we use the no water from the normal years kind of drive or at least historically, we've used it to, to uh, fuel our responses to droughts. And uh, the same structures in many cases are used to, uh, to make possible our responses to floods, to capture flood water and water. But this is a cartoon, so it's pretty extreme here. The normal is going, you know, it's, it's declining. And so what we're talking about is a future where the droughts are, are bigger, more persistent, more common, mm -hmm. frankly. And the floods, when they show up, are nasty for a variety of reasons, but they're nastier. So at least I think that California will increasingly need to manage its floods, get through its droughts, and vice versa. Um, and so, you know, it's almost a matter of leaving the normal years out of the loop. You know, breathe a sigh of relief during a normal year, but really, we're using, you know, floods will be greater, will constitute a greater uh, fraction of the water availability. And so we gotta do what we can to keep that water in the mix that, that gets, you know, the long-term mix, long-term uh, operations. And, um, and then droughts, we're really gonna need to uh, use the space created by um, droughts and by overdrafts. Uh, for capturing the floodwaters and reducing the long-term or and or reducing the long-term demands. Now, all of you are saying, I know that, but I just had to say it in case somebody had stumbled in here. I hadn't been thinking of it this way. So now I'm changing gears. Like I said, just a few things. I'm almost done here. Uh, let me see. Increased variability will be ever more challenging in a system that's pushed towards its limits. Um, I'm going to blame this one on Mike Anderson, our student, student climatologist, who I was talking with, and uh, this is what we kind of came up with. This is me saying, it's not all my fault. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so as you can read there, it says, current regulations have a significant climate base bias, uh, basis, I'm sorry, they're based in his, uh, historical expectations. But climate variability and seasonality are likely to change under these projections. An example that we came up with, or two examples, were water year 2013 and 2022, when most of the precipitation arrived in autumn, followed by really dry winters. And uh, that's it. Sierra Nevada, Northern Sierra Nevada precipitation index in this diagram, the normals being the uh, bars, and then the two different years being uh, the uh, curves there. And um, <clears throat> so, and yet the re regulatory decisions mostly reflected really wet year to date with this sort of implicit, uh, implicit notion that maybe it'll keep going, going um, to what maybe was a dangerous extent, uh, to a dangerous extent. And so wild idea number two, this one wasn't so wild. Everyone in the room said, "I know that." Um, was should regulatory should the regulatory framework be made more flexible? Perhaps here I'm getting really crazy. Perhaps even uh, forecast informed, sub sub seasonal to seasonal forecast informed, especially as their as their accuracy improves um, to accommodate a California that is likely to have increasing within year and year to year precipitation variability in the decades to come. One more, and then I'll really get out of here later, um, is climate, or you can read that, climate change impacts on CBP 
and the SWP are not written in stone. Okay. And what my point here is, is that chances are, I'm going to say 95 out of 100 of the studies that have been done uh, to look at California water and to figure out how we're, what we need to adapt to and all that have been based on climate change projections. Um, and often, most often, some sort of land, uh, I'm sorry, some sort of hydrologic model or something. And I'm saying 95 out of 100 of those studies have assumed that the landscape doesn't change, the forest cover doesn't change, crops don't change, you go down the list. And those things are actually in our hands. You guys are the guys who know better than I do how difficult it is to drive that particular engine, but most of those things are in our hands. And so as a matter of fact, we don't necessarily have to accept those numbers. We can do things to change how much water we're gonna lose or, or that sort of thing. I think even we can change uh, to an extent when the water shows up. It's like we can't fix it, but we can, we can fight back. Okay. by doing things up in the watersheds, I would argue, um, to trap the water up there more, more, more so. I mean, in this paper, in last December's S-Fuse, uh, we argued, you know, things that we're already doing, but not for this purpose, uh, get the beavers back, or at least beaver analogs back into the watersheds in the Sierra Nevada. Um, what I called upstream furo, I think somebody here mentioned furo, uh, which is forecast informed reservoir operations, which again is a you know, big deal that's going around uh, California, certainly, and, and up and down the West Coast, at least. Um, that uh, so far, every one of the furo studies, uh, the evaluations of whether it's safe and, and, and uh, worthwhile, uh, has been at the bottom of the door. In these systems, and we need to start looking at how we manage the water up in the, up in the watersheds in order to have you know use existing reservoirs, but to uh, make sure well to try and keep as I put it in that article keep the water in the watersheds longer. Okay, and then the other one is uh, we're we're spending you know some, somewhat over a billion dollars. I guess I know it's over a billion. I don't think it's over two on uh, forest health initiatives in this state. But then I am mostly towards well forest health and forest fires. And we get the word back uh, that, hey, these, this is gonna have water supply advantages too. And I mean, not just that way, I keep going to the meetings and saying, what if we were to, instead of just saying, here's some collateral benefit, water supply. What if we were to actually go in and plan those forest health initiatives to get the, you know, to choose a level of water, additional water supply and design their bloody things to, um, to try and get that, that back, okay? To get that water back, the climate change is gonna to try to either take away by evaporating it off in a warmer world or bring it down to us when, we, when we're not ready for it. It's not the time of year to use it. And this thing, how I cope with it. So it is my summer slide, and I haven't said anything here. I don't think that I haven't said to you already. So, you know, I'm going to go over. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Hey, John, you are up next. Yeah, I have a presentation. Yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I think I just moved the mic around. Yes. So um, after that interesting talk, I have a, a data-free talk with you. Um, uh, I um, It'll be short and uh, hopefully open it up for questions that you might have for Mike or for me. My perspective is really looking at climate change from a, a sort of ecologist perspective and an environmental perspective. And um, uh, let me just get into it. Um, so I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the historical decisions and trade-offs that have locked us into the sorts of tools that we have to today to cope with the changing environment. And, and then I'll try to answer questions you may have. Our current novel Delta ecosystem is radically different than the historical system, just as the current climate is radically different than historic baselines. In the Delta, we've opted 
for a system that tries to minimize variation due to extremes in an effort to optimize resource management, primarily water in our case. As a result, the natural variability of the delta in terms of flows, salinity, tides, and habitat is greatly diminished. By this, I mean that the challenges of managing the delta don't stem solely from lack of flow, increasing salinity, and loss of wetlands, although those are features, but rather I mean that the, the loss of variability in those features has led to a very different ecological system. And so by, just to give you a historical case for this, by the 1880s, the combination of placer mining in the north and water withdrawals from the San Joaquin watershed had transformed the delta's hydrology and geomorphology already. And that led to the first major decline in the salmon fishery, which was at one time the largest on the West Coast. Um, well, hydraulic placer mining was effectively ended by the Woodruff decision in 1884, high sediment loading forever changed the geomorphology of the river system and the delta. To manage sediment-driven flooding, the hardened system of canals and, levi and levees that characterized the modern delta was built. This new delta was effective at carrying a higher volume of water and the upstream Sacramento River floodplains, which once held a great quantity of water during the summers and released it slowly, these were essentially eliminated for uh, agriculture and also for flood control. So water could be moved out of the system more effectively. This led to a system of higher flows and lower residence time as water was directed to farms and cities or to delta outflow. At around this time, the San Joaquin River itself was running dry from ag diversions, and this is likely responsible for the collapse of the spring run Chinook salmon population, which at that time dominated the fishery, um, and which has never recovered. The Central Valley and state water projects of the 20th century stabilized water supply for a short time, largely due to the major dams on the Sacramento and Feather Rivers, but just as water withdrawals in the San Joaquin prevented spring rung Chinook from returning to rivers to spawn, so too did the large dams prevent winter run Chinook salmon from accessing their spawning habitat in the headwaters of mountain streams. And this led to a major decrease in their population as they became confined to a very narrow slice of cold water habitat that ironically was found in the tailwaters of Shasta Reservoir, which prevented their passage. Um, so salmon hatcheries were created uh, to help bolster fall run Chinook, a different race of salmon, uh, for fisheries production, which while this run was never as prominent as the spring run, had an adaptive advantage. It favored lowland main stems of rivers and it favored migrating upstream in the late fall and leaving in spring, which was an extremely convenient life history adaptation that coincided with the reoperated flood patterns or flow patterns on the Sacramento River and its tributaries. This new homogenized system worked for a while. Flows and salinities were managed to optimize water delivery and still supported a semi-domesticated salmon fishery. But by 1975, a first post-project drought hit was very short and very deep drought that shocked the public and managers alike. And I remember it uh, quite well, actually, myself. In response, a few last rivers were dammed, like the Stanislaus, uh, and that provided a bit more water, but also threatened wild non-hatchery salmon runs. By the 1980s, our first serious extended post-project -drought, post droughts hit, and this is when unforeseen environmental effects in the Delta also began increasing. The 80s drought series started with a very dry year in 1985, which was punctuated by a very high flow year in 1986. And the combination of extremes, a very dry, followed by blowout floods, followed by a drought, coincided with the establishment of some of the most egregious invasive species that we have in the Delta. The benthic community at that time was pretty much wiped out by the combination of drought and flood, and the resumption of drought provided a low flow, warm, and somewhat empty ecosystem that was ready for the introduction of new species that were being carried by increasing international trade and shipping. The new Delta ecosystem was increasingly dominated by organisms from the Southeast US, from South America and Asia, and it is to this day. Two of these species are particularly egregious ecosystem engineers. They have the capacity to alter ecosystem functioning by changing physical habitat and dominating interspecific interactions through competition or predation. 
One is the aquatic weed, Egeria densa or Brazilian waterweed. And the other is a popcorn-sized clam, Potamocorbula amurensis, or the Amur River or overbite clam. The waterweed had been detected in the Delta for decades, but didn't really become abundant until the late 1980s following the drought. In the South Delta, which was managed to export water, it found reliably highly stable conditions that it needed to persist. Slow moving, warm, increasingly clear water because of upstream dams uh, maintained fresh by the projects. Uh, Egeria became problematically dense in the 1990s and began expanding its range into the North Delta in the 2000s, corresponding with a series of droughts. Its uh, dense stands reduce open water habitat for smelt and reduce foraging habitat for salmon and provide a refuge for invasive piscivorous fish like largemouth bass. The clam preys upon zooplankton larvae and competes with adult zooplankton for phytoplankton food. At a density of thousands of individuals per cubic meter, it has seriously impaired the food web of the low salinity portion of the estuary. The clam relies on brackish water, and in very wet years, it tends to retreat to the west, and in drought years, it becomes very dense and expands its range eastward following brackish water. Both of these ecosystem engineers thrive in homogeneous environments. They're the products of our efforts to maintain stasis for better manageability, excuse me, for better manageability, and they've created a double whammy for both salmon and smelts, as well as other native fishes. Low food availability in the low salinity zone and bad habitat in the freshwater delta, where they're also subject to export from delta pumps. These fishes have again declined since the 2000s, post-invasion, and currently a number of them are in, on an extinction spiral. And we don't have any great tools with which to manage these very disruptive invasive species, in part because the system we built is an ideal kind of place for them. Extreme climate variability might ironically have some impact. If the Delta were to alternate between salty and fresh years, salty and fresh in some years, it would likely wipe out a lot of these uh, water weeds. Introduced fishes would likely decrease in, in response, in abundance, and native fishes are more or less adapted to move with the salinity field. And in extremely wet years, the clams tend to retreat and move westward, releasing their dominance of the food web in places like Sassoon Marsh, at least for a while. While the prospect of a salty delta or an occasionally salty delta, delta is extremely problematic, there is a reasonably high probability that the delta will go salty in the next 50 to 100 years, either due to drought, levee failure, or sea level rise. Ironically, the current physical configuration of the delta is really vulnerable to extreme events. The historic delta held less water volume and had less flood accommodation space. And it also had more complex landscape features that would have buffered salinity incursions. The new delta, has barrier and wetland-free channels that are designed to move water in both directions. Landscape management has allowed us to choose which ecosystem services we will leverage for short-term economic or public benefit, but at the same time, the hardening of this system has reduced its capacity to deal with environmental change. And so we have to consider what our most valuable assets will be going forward. Uh, costs of maintaining the Delta in its current state are only going to increase, but they're generally supported by the cost of water. My questions about the future are what happens if the costs become too high and we decide to abandon the Delta? Is there a way to do that which also provides gains as well as losses? And can we intentionally plan a novel ecosystem that accommodates a variety of community needs rather than an unmanaged retreat? And so with that, I'll, um, I'll take any questions about specifics or about other questions you might have about climate change and Delta ecosystems. Well, I think what we'll do is move on. Some that sounds good. Me? Just a little bit. Because I'll be good at back and forth next time I come to California. Yeah.
Hey man, while you're up there, is there a way to change the? Oh, um. Looks like it might be okay now. This maybe I have a different to add to that ratio than like that. It's okay. Did you figure out who looks this like slower? It wouldn't do anything. Oh, that's the first one. Very good. Awesome. Okay, well, I will change gears a little bit um, and talk uh, a little bit specifically about DWR and the Safe Water Project's approach to climate change analysis and kind of more specifically about how we're communicating the risks to, to water users and, and what we're doing about it. Um, and I think hopefully I'll be able to tie a lot of what we're doing to the two talks that, that we've already heard. Um, I'll be presenting the slides, but I have two of my colleagues with me, Eric Reyes and Aaron Miller, that'll help answer questions that you all might have. Okay, so two of the major improvements that we have made, the State Water Project and Climate Action Planning uh, that we're working on uh, is improvements to our State Water Project Delivery Capability Report that was just released uh, last month. Uh, and this shows future water delivery um, if we continue in a business as usual uh, manner in terms of regulations and operations and infrastructure, um, no adaptation, but with climate continuing to warm and precipitation becoming more extreme. And uh, the headline from that, uh, if you uh, caught the uh, LA Times or San Francisco Chronicle articles in the last week, uh, was 13 to 23 percent declines in average annual deliveries of state water project water supply 2043, so 20 years into the future. Pretty substantial. Uh, the second thing that we are currently still working on uh, that will be out end of this year, early next year, is a SWP climate adaptation plan, which takes those scenarios, also looks further into the future and says, well, what if we you know, change how we operate, we add some infrastructure, how, how well can we continue to operate in this changing future? Things like Delta conveyance, forecast informed reservoir operations, which you've talked about, uh, and additional storage for those big wet extremes that Mike talked about can be used in drought years. So uh, let me talk about the first one, the State Water Project Delivery Capability Report. Um, what is that? It's a biannual report of existing delivery capability, covers a range of hydrologic conditions. So not just the long-term average, but extended dry cycles and wet cycles. Uh, and it's used extensively by our water contractors for their planning. Uh, it also includes future delivery capability, uh, which we started looking at uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, and in this report, we, we, we look 20 years into the future. Uh, and that, that's basically uh, for, the, for the benefit of our water contractors, our water users, they have a lot of planning activities, uh, state mandated, mandated planning activities where they have to look 20 years out into the future. So that's, that's what we're providing. But it's always using a business as usual. And what I mean by that is holding uh, regulations, infrastructure, operations kind of at today's uh, levels and not assuming that we add things that are still in the planning phases. Uh, this turns out to be a super important uh, document statewide for uh, the different water users uh, that get state water project uh, water. So, uh, you know, 27 million Californians get some percentage of their water from the state water project. Um, and this information from the delivery capability report goes into sustainable groundwater management plans, urban water management plans, ag management plans, integrated regional, regional plans, and, and other resource plans. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, it's important for how we're communicating this risk and uncertainty to our users. Um, it also turns out to be important internally for the state water project because it goes into our future energy resource planning, our asset maintenance and management studies, environmental impact reports, 
and other long-term studies. So this is one of the key reasons why we focused on this, or these are the kind of the key reasons we focused on this report uh, for making some key enhancements. So the first thing that we did for this round that has not previously been done was to account for climate changes that have already occurred. So this is an explicit acknowledgement of, of the non-stationarity of California's hydroclimate. As far as I'm aware, it's one of the first you know, management reports that really does this explicitly, where we previously were using the 100-year uh, historical hydrology and saying, well, you know, the future or the, the current conditions are, you know, a fluctuation within that envelope of, of, of variability, of interannual and, and decadal variability. We're now saying, no, that's probably not good enough. We need to adjust, particularly those earlier years in that 100 year record that weren't nearly as warm, that weren't nearly as, as wild as Mike pointed out. Uh, and we need to account for that. So we're doing that in this report. We were also, uh, previous, uh, all previous DCRs going back to 2007, had just one future projection of saying, 20 years from now, this is what our water deliveries will be. Of course, everybody in this room knows we have no way of having that kind of certainty, but that was what our, you know, our contractors, of course, wanted certainty. They want, well, just tell us what the deliveries are going to be. Uh, and they groused quite a bit about this change. We did a lot of work to communicate this and to socialize it with them. And, it, and it's still, uh, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, but it's clear that we, we have to be honest about the uncertainty in these projections and what we do know and what we don't know. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what those risk informed future climate scenarios look like. Third thing is we had both of these pieces peer reviewed independently by the Delta Science Program and their independent peer review process. So we got comments and, and had independent reviewers take a look at those and, 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 and give us comments. And, and we made quite a few edits and changes to those, those documents. There's lots of backup documentation of the panel would like to look more deeply into that. Um, and then it also gave us a, uh, a, a honeydew list, if you will, of uh, things to continue to work on in the future that we weren't able to necessarily get into these but we will continue to work on. And then just greater alignment with all of our other activities within DWR, uh, management agencies, especially large ones like DWR that do a lot of things have often been accused of being overly complex and having different data and different uh, approaches for different pieces of the agency and, and making that uh, very confusing and difficult for the local agencies that have to comply with those regulations and do that planning. Uh, we've tried uh, to, we've done a lot of work to align these activities across all of DWR's activities. And so when the 2027 CBFPP comes out, a Central Valley Flood Protection Plan comes out, which is also a department document um, in, in collaboration with the uh, Central Valley Flood Protection Board, um, it'll have very similar type climate scenarios and approaches. Okay, so what did that shift to um, an explicit acknowledgement that climate change is already occurring? What, what did that show? Uh, so in our 2021 DCR, the last time we did this report, uh, we were showing 2.3 million acre feet of annual deliveries on average. Um, and what we're showing now is, is uh, just over 2.2 million acre feet. The percentages there are average annual allocation to our contractors. Uh, that's maybe more complex than folks need to understand, but basically uh, it's about a 5% decrease in volume just based on the climate changes that have already occurred, not regulations, not, uh, not any other issue, this is mainly uh, climate change. It's picking up uh, the more uh, interannual variability and in runoff uh, because of the, the signal that we're feeding it with this adjusted historical climate, more seasonal variability. So years like uh, 2022 that Mike showed that had this this big, uh, you know, pulse of, of rain uh, in, in December and then go dry. Um, or I guess that was November and, and January and then go dry. Uh, 
higher spring flow or higher winter flows and lower spring flows. So the earlier snow melt that we've been seeing for years, and this all adds up to about a 5% loss of cod. Okay, so that's kind of the, the climate changes that have already uh, occurred. And now we're talking about new risk informed future climate scenarios that we're providing. Uh, there are three of them in our new report. And what these, uh, in these scenarios are, are combinations of future conditions that evaluate climate changes. So temperature, precipitation, and sea level rise. And they, they represent different levels of risk that we're calling levels of concern for our system, for the state water project mm -hmm. system. Uh, and so they're, they're specifically configured to the risks that the state water project faces. Uh, and they come with a percent number uh, that basically describes the percent of climate models that suggest uh, this level of impact uh, or less. Okay, so the way to think about this, that's a lot of words, it's not really easy to understand. So the way to think about this is the, you know, the cone of uncertainty that we've all seen before, right? We're sitting here at the present and we have this wide uh, cone of uncertainty as we move out into the future um, that we may end up anywhere in this circle. We we expect to be somewhere in the center, but we might be at one of these edges, right? And you can think about it that somewhere across that circle, there's an axis of outcomes where at the bottom, they're less challenging. And at the top, they're more challenging for a, a given system, right? So uh, these down here are for us, uh, more precipitate, those scenarios that show more precipitation, less warming, and less sea level rise, right? And up here are hot, dry, more sea level rise, more extreme precipitation. And we, we understand where this access is because we've done a lot of exploration of our system using uh, deep uncertainty techniques and a lot of different modeling across uh, stress testing and, and, and different, different outcomes. And, and we've learned what our system is, is specifically uh, stressed by and, and what the combination of precipitation and temperature change is that really is, is worst for us. And so what we end up with is these three scenarios. The first one is a 50th percentile level of concern. This is very analogous to the scenario that we've always provided in the past, which is the kind of the central tendency of the climate models. Half of them say it might be worse than this, half of them say it might be better than this, uh, or better, worse in, the, in terms of wet or dry or this axis of, of most stress, okay? So this scenario, if you look at the, the, the you know, the, the metrics of what it shows, it's uh, a degree and a half Celsius warmer than current conditions. It's uh, about a percent and a half wetter on average because the average of all of these climate models show a slight wetting for California. And it's got 11% more intense precipitation, okay? So what that means is exactly what Mike was pointing out, that this, this stretching of the, of the precipitation signal to the extremes get bigger, 11, the 99th percentile extreme event gets 11% bigger. And within that average change in precipitation, you've got to, if you're putting more, more precipitation into the wettest events, it's got to come out of somewhere else, right? So it's coming out of the dry events. And then you've got six inches of sea level rise in the center. Then we move up to a 75th percentile level of concern. So now about 75% of the climate model outcomes kind of show a less extreme outcome for, for the state water project area. Um, more. So more, I'm sorry, more extreme. Uh, well, actually it's less extreme. So if you, if, if you're planning to this one, you're being more protective, right? You're, 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 you're using a more extreme scenario. So it's a little bit warmer. On a, it's about the same average precipitation as we have now. So it's, it's drier than this one. Precipitation extremeness, intensity gets more extreme. And now you've got 12 inches of sea level. And finally, in 95th percentile, we would consider this not the worst case scenario, because of course there's 5% beyond this that are even worse, and there's always something that can be worse, right? But this is a pretty bad one, right? This is, if you're planning to this, you're being very protective. Uh, you're planning for kind of a, a really bad outcome. 
So it's, it's quite warm, almost two degrees Celsius warmer, uh, almost 2% drier on average than we are now, 13% more extreme and still 12, 12 inches of sea level. So those are the three scenarios that we have provided to our, our users. Uh, and what that shows in terms of average annual SWP table A deliveries to our contractors uh, is uh, with no climate change adaptation, we're likely to see decreases in average long-term deliveries of 13 to 23% across those three scenarios. So this slide is a little bit of a, a historical look back at how have our projections over time, our look aheads of the future of, of current uh, operations and look aheads in the future have changed over time in our delivery reports every two years. So the, 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 the horizontal axis here is the report year, right? Not, not any you know, timeline of years, but so in 20, what is that, 11, you know, you had uh, your, your current deliveries up here, just above 2.5 million acre, acre feet a year. And our 20 year look, uh, look ahead into the future showing, you know, minor, climate impacts, and you can see what's happened over time. Okay, so this first decline out to 2021 in our current delivery, that didn't account for climate changes that had already occurred. So that's mostly regulatory. That's changes in regulation that make it harder for us to operate, and we have lost some deliveries based on changes in regulation. This, this decline here from the last report to this report, 5%, that's mostly climate driven. And then on top of that is the 13 to 23% of future climate change that would, would continue to degrade our ability to do what we want. So um, one of the questions that we were asked to talk about was what are the key SWP operational challenges? Uh, and, and we see them all over these, these scenarios and the signals that we're picking up. So loss of snowpack, that earlier runoff where it has to pass through the reservoir because of flood control requirements uh, during the winter season. Um, so even if it's the same amount of total water, if it comes early, it flows through the reservoir uh, and it's not available for water supply later in the year or management later in the year. Uh, use of storage that we do have in the reservoir to meet Delta regulations. This gets harder and harder with sea level rise as you have a higher and higher uh, hydrostatic force of, you know, seawater pu pushing in. And so we're releasing more water to keep the Delta fresh and to meet those regulations. Water temperature issues below dams. So of course we release uh, cold water during certain times of the year to, um, trick the salmonids into to breeding below the dam, uh, thinking that they're higher in the watershed. Uh, that, that has a water cost as well. And it's getting harder and harder to meet those targets with warmer and warmer reservoir temperatures, air temperatures that translate into reservoir temperatures and lower, lower reservoir volume. Uh, increasing demands. So this is from the ET signal that, that Mike uh, talked about increasing demands for agriculture and, and, and these depletions along the Sac River, not least of which come from, you know, groundwater pumping over the last hundred years that have lowered the groundwater table and, and especially in dry years, change what used to be gaining reaches of the stream to losing reaches. And so we have to make up for that um, when, those, when there's uh, depletions in the river. Extreme weather events, that's, we've seen that in spades in the last uh, several years, but 10 years uh, specifically. And then we've got, you know, the, the State Water Project is, you know, 60, 70 years old. We've got a lot of aging infrastructure. We've got uh, parts of the aqueduct that have subsided along the San Joaquin Valley and reduced our capacity to move water. So we've got a lot of costs uh, to, to bring that infrastructure up to, you know, current standards and, and uh, reestablish its, its full capacity. Okay, so so that's that's the bad news. The the maybe the, the better news is we think we can keep up with climate. 
uh, that we're we're uh, you know, that we're developing several significant projects that we think provide substantial climate adaptation and resilience. Um, and we're evaluating those current strategies both alone and in combination to think uh, to, to see how they work together uh, and how how they can uh, complement each other to 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 give us a better future than what the DCR is showing. So it really builds on top of that DCR work and shows alternative futures where we have improvements in place by 2045. We'll look further into the future out to the to 2085 to the 